Hey everybody, today we are debating God's existence and we are starting right now. All right, everybody, stoked to have you here as we are starting this extremely uh, just anticipated debate. Uh, I've mentioned before that Tom Jump has been kind of like the dark horse in the debate world. He just kind of popped up and it was like, who's this guy? And it was like, whoa, this guy is really well read and this guy is really able to keep track of what's going on in the debate. So very good debater. And of course, you all know the warrior, the man behind inspiring philosophy, Michael Jones, who is also, I, I would say tonight, this might be our two best debaters we've had on the show. Like that's very possible, very plausible even. And so Mike, you know as well, guy reads like a machine and he is here to debate as well. We're very glad to have both of these gentlemen as Michael also has extensive debate experience, which has allowed him to uh, succeed very much on on YouTube and outside of YouTube as well. So if you are new here, we are stoked to have you here. Just want to say we would love to have you hit that subscribe button for future debates as we have future ones coming up, hopefully with these two gentlemen as we've enjoyed them so much. And also want to quick give an introduction to Shannon Q. Thanks for coming on to help Coma, Shan. It's seriously helpful. We're glad to have you here. Oh, I'm really happy. I'm excited. Can't wait to have a front row seat. <laughs> it's going to be a blast. And one thing too, want to mention coming up, we're very excited about this controversial one. This is one that both of our debaters that are here tonight have debated this gentleman before. Kent Hovind will be debating with Cy Gart. That's next week on Monday. And that's our science and religion at war. So that will definitely be a, uh, a wild one. I think it's going to be a blast. So. Hopefully everybody can make it to that. Now, I'm going to quick just mention that the debaters have their links down in the description. Highly encourage you to check them out, even if you don't like them. Even if you're just like, that, that inspiring philosophy, Mike Jones. You're gonna love him. You, you know what, he's gonna grow on you. So I highly encourage you to check out their links. And Shannon Q's link is also in the description. We appreciate her help tonight. And whether you are a Christian, atheist, or one of the many strange creatures in between, we're glad you're here. We are shooting for a nonpartisan platform. If we ever veer off from that, if we're ever unfair to any of the debaters, call us out. I'm going to quick give the debaters a chance to share about what's been going on at their channel for maybe like 30 to 60 seconds if they want to just share what they've been up to. And then we're going to hand it over to Shannon to get this party started. So Mike Jones, want to say thanks for coming on, man. What have you been up to at your channel, Inspiring Philosophy? All right, well, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, finishing up some videos on objections to God's existence. Next video will be the Evil God Challenge, and I'll do a video on faith and reason and how faith is defined in the Bible. And then I'm starting a very long, long series on the Old Testament. Going to go through Genesis, going to go through some archaeology, going to do a series on cultural context. But I'm going to start going through Genesis 1, 2, 3, do one video for each chapter. And so that's what I got coming up. Awesome. Right on, man. Well, we're thrilled to have you back. And Tom Jump, good to see you, bud. Thanks for coming on. And what have you been up to at your channel? Uh, thanks for having me on. I always appreciate the opportunity to debate. Um, I wrote an epistemology model of morality, and I created my YouTube channel in order to demonstrate how effective these are at debating religious apologists. And that's what I do on my YouTube channel. I also have a debate with Kent coming up in the middle of next month. So that'll be fun. Godspeed. <laughs> you betcha. So we're oh, thrilled. God. I'm thrilled for you. Let us know. We will, uh, if you let us know when that debate will be for either of you guys, uh, we will plug it here at the channel. And uh, for those of you out there, we want to just get a, get you as many debates uh, as you want, as you probably love debates if you're here right now. We don't care what channel they're at. We want to let you know about it. So uh, definitely uh, check back in as we try to announce it. And in fact, I think Tom has a debate next week uh, on capturing Christianity. Do I, did I get that right, Tom? Yep, with right. um, Josh Rasmussen. So I believe that's, I don't yeah. know how to pronounce his name. Correct. Yeah, so stoked for that. Highly encourage people to check out Capturing Christianity. I think he's in the live chat. You can click on the three little uh, circles next to his name, and that'll bring you to his channel. You can sub and then get a reminder of that debate. So ex excited for that. And then Michael Jones, 
we're hopefully going to have back, uh, there's a potential, I won't name it, it's a mysterious debate, but it's coming up hopefully next month. So, um, very excited. <laughs> Shan, I'm handing it off to you. Thanks so much for moderating with us, Shan. And uh, Shanna, why don't you, we'd want, love to have you share about what's going on at your channel. Oh, okay, sure. So I, I'm an atheist, dirty, evil atheist. And uh, on my channel, I talk about the intersection between psychology and faith. And I also try to host productive dialogues between people of all faiths so that we can model better conversations uh, between communities. So I'm actually going to be having a, a conversation. I'm not really a debater. I'm more of a conversationalist. I'm more interested in finding things out than I am in demonstrating what I know. So. Uh, I'm more so interested in having dialogue. So uh, coming up, I'm actually having uh, several XJWs on my channel uh, this Saturday, actually, to, to talk about uh, some of the mental health risks in apostasy and, and how they've dealt with them. I'm having Lloyd Evans and Telltale Atheist and Mentally Diseased on. So that'll be this Saturday at, I believe it's 11 a.m. Eastern, but I'll have to double check with them. So that's the next thing I'm doing. You and thank you. <laughs> well, we're, we're honored to have you, Shannon. Thanks for helping out. And so uh, we will, as I mentioned, hand the uh, ball over to Shannon and she will get uh, us rolling by first explaining the format and then we'll just jump right into it. Perfect. So we are going to start with two 12-minute segments where each of our participants is going to have an opportunity to present their best case. And after those two 12 minute segments are done, as everybody prefers, including me, we're gonna have some open dialogue for about 45 minutes. After that open dialogue, we are going to take audience questions. If you want to ensure that your question is asked and answered, please make sure that you send a super chat. Uh, and also please keep respectful. If you can't send a super chat, that's fine, but you have a really pertinent question, please tag at Modern Day Debate in the chat so that we can make sure that we get your question and we're not mixed in with the regular conversations that you guys are having in the side chat. So without further ado, our first presenter this evening who is going to present the case for why there is a God is going to be Mike. So Mike, let me know when you're ready and I'll start the timer for you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen, so let me get that set up here. Yeah, absolutely. Take your time, you and James coordinate that, and then once you feel like you're ready, I will get everything going. And again, I will reiterate while we're working on that, please tag Modern Day Debate in the side chat if you right. have a question. Are you ready, James, Mike? Let me, know, let me know when you're ready. We are. I can see the presentation. Ready. All right, well, I'm happy to have this conversation today because I've been turned down multiple times to debate the topic. James knows from one back in the fall. Um, the debate topic tonight is, does God exist? Now, as a classical apologist, I'll be arguing a theistic or deistic worldview is more probable given the evidence. So I don't claim I can prove God exists. I won't be arguing specifically for Christ Christian theism tonight. I'll be arguing for basic theism or deism, and I'll present three arguments that God exists. My aim is to show that deism or theism is the best explanation given the available data. So the first argument I'll present is the digital physics argument. Okay. Um, in several of my videos, I've presented various lines of evidence. Space-time is emergent and not fundamental. So I'll go over some of that. In the hunt to rectify quantum mechanics with relativity, physicists discovered something known as the holographic principle, a theory which suggests the entire three-dimensional universe can be seen as two-dimensional information. So in other words, the whole three-dimensional universe, the particles that make up reality, would emerge from underlying information in quantum field theory. In 2017, a peer-reviewed study published observable evidence of the holographic principle. From looking at irregularities in the background radiation, their team found that simple equations of quantum field theory uh, could explain almost all the cosmological observations is marginally better fit than the standard model, and it can potentially explain apparent anomalies. I won't go into that that much right now. Um, the emergent features of space-time can be seen elsewhere. A study from later that year argued quantum entanglement is an inevitable feature of reality. Quote directly, they say, we show that any theory with a classical limit must contain entangled states, thus establishing entanglement as an inevitable feature of any theory superseding, superseding classical theory. Thus, the information between particles does not seem to be affected by space as it can be transferred instantly, implying space is not fundamental for the underlying world of quantum mechanics, but an emergent phenomena of the classical world that would only exist after measurement. Now, I can argue the emergent nature uh, uh, the emergent nature of matter and space-time from numerous areas, be it quantum mechanics, holographic, print, holographic principle, uh, Brian Whitworth's features of a virtual reality uh, versus an objective reality, or in many other ways. 
But the idea of space-time as emergent is not and not fundamental. It's accepted by more and more physicists every day. Uh, physicist uh, Hyun Suk Yang says emergent space-time is the new fundamental paradigm for quantum gravity. Uh, thus, the most up-to-date evidence suggests all of what we experience, space-time, matter, all seem to be emergent constructs of the class of the classical world, uh, not fundamental aspects of reality. But then the question becomes, what does space-time emerge from? Well, essentially, the classical world emerges from the underlying information or the universal wave function of the quantum realm. However, interestingly enough, the same underlying features have been seen to parallel conscious thought processes. In 2009, physicist Diedrich Ertz took this one step further and published a paper noting that our cognitive processes can, quote, be readily modeled using the mathematical formulism of quantum mechanics, end quote. In other words, our inner mental world of thoughts, quality, and emotions can be modeled in terms of Hilbert space and quantum processes, the same processes that give rise to space, time, and matter. So space, time, and matter are emergent from the quantum wave function in Hilbert space, and the inner world of consciousness and mind can be modeled via quantum processes in the study of quantum cognition. So this would suggest the evidence implies emergent space, time would be indistinguishable from the same properties of a mind. So the simplest explanation is the universe is just emergent from a mind. If what the universe emerges from resembles a mind, it is far more parsimonious to accept it is in fact. This is also backed by the recent work of astrophysicist Franco Vaza and neurosurgeon Alberto Felitti, who wrote an article, and uh, Vaza has written papers on this as well, on the similarities between neural networks and the cosmic web of galaxies. Uh, there they show the properties of neural networks in the brain are similar to the cosmic web of galaxies, something we would expect if the universe is emergent from a mind. So here's a formal representation of the digital physics argument uh, to save time. I, I won't go into it here, but I think I've presented enough evidence to back up the case the universe is emerging from a mind. The second argument I'd like to present is something called the cosmic conscious argument. It was named for Eugene Wigner's work. Uh, premise one, contingent minds either have personal explanations or natural explanations. Uh, this is not too controversial. Almost all theories of mind either hold to reductionist type views or believe consciousness is irreducible as it is and would have to come from a fundamental source. Uh, premise two, quantum mechanics and other fields of science imply the natural universe is emergent from information processing and consciousness. This is the most controversial premise. Essentially, numerous experiments in quantum mechanics imply conscious, consciousness plays an important role in wave function collapse in the appearance of material reality. Uh, we can get into more of this during the discussion section. I'm more than happy to, but essentially experiments such as Interaction free experiments, the late choice quantum eraser experiments, the violation of the legate inequality, and the confirmation of the coach inspector theorem uh, lead to the inference consciousness would cause collapse. Now, this is a philosophical inference, let me point that out. Now, before, to preempt the uh, objection, interaction and decoherence alone is not enough to explain wave function collapse. Uh, so, for example, one book here notes that, that does decoherence solve the measurement problem? Clearly not. What decoherence tells us is that certain objects appear classical when they are observed. But what is an observation? At some stage, we have to apply this, the usual probability rules of quantum theory. Maximilian Schlawhauser says in his extensive paper on decoherence, that decoherence arises from a direct application of the quantum mechanical formulism to a description of the interaction of a physical system with its environment. By itself, decoherence is therefore neither an interpretation nor a modification of quantum mechanics. And thus is John von Neumann, Henry Stapp, uh, Fred Kuttner, Bruce Rosenblum, Bernard Hash, Richard Con Henry, Stephen Barr, Ian Squires, et cetera, et cetera, all argue this philosophically leads to the conclusion consciousness ultimately causes collapse in the long string of things. So what follow the appearance of, of material reality is emerging from consciousness, not the other way around. So conclusion one, the natural universe cannot be the explanation of contingent minds since material reality emerges from consciousness. And premise three, the explanation of co uh, conscious minds is personal uh, per, this personal source is what we call God, conclusion, therefore God exists. So unless Tom can demonstrate consciousness is emergent from the brain, and trust me, I am more than willing to go over numerous pieces of data and studies in neuroscience. I just got, I just finished reading John Eccles' book even. So, um, so unless he can show that consciousness is emergent from the brain, the most likely explanation is consciousness is irreducible and thus contingent minds like all of us would most likely not prove, but most likely be contingent on a larger consciousness that controls reality and brings other contingent minds into existence, who we call God. Uh, third and finally, I'll present the same line of reasoning via basic philosophy through the introspective argument. Uh, premise one, the mind exists. 
This one's not too controversial, as Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Premise two, the properties of the mind are not that which matter can have. So, so far there has been no evidence or a plausible theory that can show consciousness or mental properties can reduce to matter. As John Siri even has to admit, how does a mental reality, a world of consciousness, intentionality, and other mental phenomena fit into a world consisting entirely of physical particles and fields of force? Colin McGuinn admits, the problem with materialism is that it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. There is simply no evidence consciousness can emerge from matter. All neuroscience can show at best is correlation, not causation, and unfortunately all materialists tend to confuse this. However, the properties of matter we experience can easily be reduced to mind, since all of what we experience is a mental world of quality of sounds, etc. None of these are, are physical, they are mental phenomena. We essentially experience a mental reality, so there's no reason to posit a separate material world beyond our mental experiences. As Keith Ward says, any physicist will say that brains are mostly empty space in which molecules, atoms, electrons, quarks, and other strange particles buzz around in complicated ways. It seems as though physical objects, when not being observed, have no colors and no sounds, smells, or tastes either. Either Sounds, like colors, are not physical events. Neither are smells, tastes, or sensations. Things do not smell like, taste like, or feel like anything when nobody is smelling, tasting, or feeling them. The physical world, it seems, is totally vacuous. No colors, sounds, smells, tastes, or sensations. What on earth is left? This idea can also be explained via David Hume's bundle theory, which we can get into later. Thus, our first conclusion is mind is not reducible to matter. Um, premise three, uh, substance dualism is false. I believe Tom agrees with me on this, but you can argue via Spinoza's interaction problem. If there are two substances, they have to interact via a shared property, but if they share properties, they're just different, um, they're just different aspects of one substance. So conclusion, all is mind. If all is mind, this correlates with the previous two arguments that I gave, that there is a, a larger governing mind that brings us contingent minds into existence to experience and operate in reality. So if Tom thinks God probably does not exist or there's no reason to believe in God, he must tear down these arguments and offer a more probable explanation, not just another possible explanation, but something more probable and parsimonious. Given what I've seen in his past debates, I will contest this cannot be done. And the best explanation, the most probable and parsimonious, is a theistic worldview. And with that, I'll yield back the rest of my time. You bet. Well, thanks so much, Mike Jones. Totally appreciate it, man. And with that, we will jump back into the opening statement. So handing it back over to Shannon. Sorry, Shannon, not a habit. I jumped back in, but <laughs> you okay? go ahead, Shannon. Channel guy, you're all right. <laughs> all right, thanks, Mike. So Tom, just let me know when you are ready. I'm just gonna reset the timer and you will have 12 minutes and Mike was pretty precise. He stopped just just shy, just shy of 10 minutes for Mike. So let me know when you're ready. I'll start the timer as soon as you start speaking. All right. Um, I am an atheist. I define atheism as the positive position. There are no reasons, evidence, nor argument that indicate the existence of a God. If there is such a reason, then I will stop being an atheist. How can we know there is no evidence indicative of a God? Well, if you have a box and you said there is a rabbit in the box and your evidence for this is that the box weighs two pounds, the fact that the box weighs two pounds is not evidence of a rabbit because it can be equally explained by a lizard or coffee mug or weight or Legos, etc. The fact that this evidence works equally well for numerous other options means it is not evidence of a rabbit. The same thing applies to evidence of a God. If it works equally well for all non-God alternatives, then it's not evidence of a God. Some alternative to theism would include deism, pantheism, naturalistic pantheism, transtheism, polytheism, pastafarianism, panpsychism, etc. For the sake of time, I will only defend one of these naturalistic pantheism, which is just necessary, eternal, all-powerful nature with no mind. For more information, you can see the Stanford Encyclopedia philosophy page on pantheism and just search naturalistic pantheism. Because pantheism lacks consciousness or personhood, if any argument works equally well for pantheism as it does for theism, then that argument is not evidence of a god, as theists define it. Some theists argue that the arguments individually don't indicate a god, but they argue collectively when you add them together, they do abductively work as evidence. This is false for the exact same reason. All the arguments individually and collectively work equally for the alternatives like pantheism as they do for theism. So all arguments together are like the two pounds and are not evidence of a god. For example, the cosmological argument, the universe could have been created by a necessary pantheism. The teleological argument, there could be an undiscovered super law grounded in the nature of pantheism that interconnects all the boundary conditions explaining the fine tuning. The moral argument, there could be an undiscovered law of nature that's grounded in pantheism. The transcendental argument, there could be an undiscovered law of nature grounded in math and logic in the nature of pantheism. All of these arguments individually and collectively work for pantheism just as well or better than they do for theism. And so even if you add all other arguments together, you still get the same result. 
The reason this is the case is that all theist arguments are false, because no known form of knowledge can justify stopping points for truth, such as metaphysical claims, absolute truths, or similar such claims. A stopping point for truth is something that, by definition, there is nothing beyond it, like saying God is by definition not created. Therefore, all arguments and evidence for God will all necessarily work for any alternative because of the principle of explosion. From falsehood, anything follows. Uh, anything science can't answer, theology also can't answer. For example, take the position of metaphysical naturalism, which is the position that the nature is all there is and there is absolutely no supernatural. Even given all of the evidence of the natural world that does not show there is no supernatural, because there could always be a supernatural realm out there that we just haven't discovered yet. The same thing applies to claims of a god, like there is only one god. Even if we had as much evidence for a god as we do for the natural world, that would not show the god was not created by another greater god for the exact same reason. There could always be another greater god out there that we just haven't discovered yet. This also applies to all metaphysical properties, like all-powerful God, all-knowing God, all-loving, eternal, necessary, defined society, pure actuality, etc. There can always be another God out there that we just haven't discovered yet, which is more powerful, more knowledgeable, more good, etc. Which means that no form of human knowledge can justify those properties of anything. So if you just define God as not created or any of those other properties, it's simply an admission you are making an unsupported metaphysical claim, and I can just define the alternative like pantheism as uncreated, all-powerful, all-good, perfectly simple, etc. So just defining your explanation as having these metaphysical properties works for everything and is evidence of nothing. The same problems that prevent scientific conclusions like metaphysical naturalism from being justified as stopping points for truth also prevent religious claims from being justified as stopping points for truth, because these problems because of these problems, anything science can't answer, theology can't answer either, but we can both make stuff up. The problems outlined in the previous examples are the problem of induction and the problem of undetermination, which is why, even given all of the evidence of the natural world, that does not rule out the supernatural, and equivalent evidence for God would not rule out there being another greater God. Induction and undetermination are only applied to empirical or a posteriori forms of evidence. However, there are equivalent problems with every known form of knowledge which have the same effect, demonstrating no known form of knowledge can justify any stopping point for truth, such as metaphysical claims. A priori knowledge has the problem of the criterion, Agrippa's trilemma, the problem of the universals, the problem of easy knowledge. Math has Gödel's incompleteness theorem, logic has Tarsus' definability theorem. Moral knowledge has the open question argument and the fact-value distinction, which apply to both natural and supernatural sources, which it explicitly says on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Metaethics. So every known form of knowledge has these problems, and all these problems apply to both scientific and theological explanations. Therefore, if your explanation is or has a stopping point for truth, such as eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnibenevolent, the only divine society, pure actuality, or a brute fact, then it cannot be justified by any known form of knowledge. So any claim of something having such properties is nothing but a bald assertion, which can be demonstrated by showing the same assertions or arguments can work to support any of the alternatives, like pantheism. Now, I agree that there has to be some necessary thing to ground the existence of everything, but there is nothing further we can say about it. There is no reason, no argument, nor evidence that indicates a mind or a god. It can simply just be a form of naturalistic pantheism. The bigger problem is that metaphysical properties are de facto infinite. So when you add them to an explanation, it allows you to do an infinite amount of ad hoc reasoning, allowing you to explain away any inconsistencies which you can entail in your ad hoc explanation and the infinite property to make it seem as if it has explanatory power, when really it has none because the same method can work for literally anything. This can be demonstrated by adding such properties to any of the alternatives to theism, which point out that they can do the exact same thing. For example, theists like to define their god as perfectly simple, define a deity, by redefining simplicity as the lack of limitation. The first thing to note is that this is the exact opposite of simplicity. When you're looking for a simple explanation for any given phenomenon, the simplest explanation is the one that is the most restricted and the most limited. The least restricted is the most complicated explanation. Like what caused that noise? Is it an all-powerful being with no limitations, or was it a mouse? Obviously, the mouse is simpler. So simplicity is the most limited thing, not the least limited thing. The properties of a theistic god are omnipotent, eternal, necessary, omnibenevolent, uh, omniscient, personal, and conscious. The properties of pantheism are omnipotent, eternal, necessary. So obviously, pantheism is simpler because it only contains three of theism's seven properties. Theists argue that these are not individual properties, that they are all entailed in God's nature. And if you are allowed to add any arbitrary properties to your explanation is to assert they are all entailed in divine aseity of your position, we can do the same for any alternative. For example, we can add divine aseity to the flying spaghetti monster and say, the spaghetti is perfectly simple and anything that is not spaghetti is the privation of spaghetti. Unless you can demonstrate your definition of simplicity corresponds to the fundamental nature of reality, which no form of human knowledge can do, then it's just your own ad hoc definition, which is no more supported than me simply defining the spaghetti monster as the simplest thing. Uh, 
Another example would be the argument that God may have sufficient reason to allow suffering. That could literally be used to justify any universe with any amount of suffering. By adding the metaphysical properties to an explanation, you can explain away any criticism exactly like theists do in their for their God. The flying spaghetti monster may have some sufficient reason for raising Jesus from the dead, like if it produced more spaghetti in the future. We can also we can add the property of supernatural, spaceless, and timeless to the flying spaghetti monster and make it non-physical, magical, spaceless, timeless spaghetti, which is entailed in its nature, just like theists do with the property of consciousness. Top-down approaches to reality are wrong. Starting with metaphysical absolutes and trying to build down to understand reality is fundamentally a flawed methodology, as there is no known form of knowledge that can justify such properties, so they give us no way to show an explanation is anything more than just one of the infinitely many imaginary alternatives. Which is why science does the opposite and starts with what is demonstrable and builds up and says nothing about the absolutes and the fundamental nature of reality. It's always tentative and provisional. Any claim about the final layer of reality is unsupported. We start from somewhere in the middle and peel back layers one at a time with no end in sight in any direction so we can say nothing about what the final layer is going to be like. As a final note, we have extremely strong reasons to indicate there is no all-good, all-powerful God. If it did exist, it would have created the best of all possible worlds, which is a world where it is physically impossible for anyone, including God, to force anyone else to do something they do not voluntarily consent to doing. Anything less than this is by definition slavery and by definition immoral. Uh, a common rejoinder to this is, well, maybe the God has some sufficient reason to allow suffering. This is not possible because any possible reason God would have for not creating the best of all possible worlds can always be made morally better if he just made that reason optional and allowed people to choose it or to choose their own universe. So no matter what reason you come up with, it will always be available in the best possible world and morally superior because it's not forced on people without their consent. Therefore, no such reason is possible. In conclusion, any argument that can work for a non-God alternative is not evidence of a God, like the rabbit in the box analogy. The same problems that prevent scientific claims from justifying metaphysical pro properties also prevent theological claims from justifying them. All metaphysical properties are unsupported by any known form of knowledge and are bald assertions which necessarily work for all of the alternatives. Metaphysical properties allow for an infinite amount of ad hoc reasoning, so you can always solve any problems with them, and so they also work for any of the non-God alternatives. Even though I grant there is a necessary thing, there is no evidence that tells us anything about it. Pantheism is simpler than theism, and the problem of involuntary suffering rules out Christian God and makes an impersonal necessary thing like pantheism the better explanation. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Okay. So you were just under two. Both of you were just under 10 minutes. Those are two incredibly fascinating opening statements. So before we go into the back and forth, we have about 45 minutes. You guys were each a little bit short, so I'm going to take a few moments to just kind of explain what a horrible taskmaster I am. So I, I, please do your best not to talk over each other. I know both of you are incredibly respectful of, and, and it's probably not going to be an issue, but just to, just to lay it out ahead of time, uh, I'm probably only going to interject if I feel as though there's something that may be a little bit uh, too convoluted or needs clarification for the viewers. Uh, but ultimately, I'm going to let you guys kind of guide this conversation. Uh, Tom, since you were the last person to present, Mike, I'd like to give you the opportunity to open this dialogue if you feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I, had, um, I wrote down a bunch of notes um, on there. A lot of stuff I wanted to go over. Um, Tom, two things about when you, you said simplest explanation um, being the thing. I mean, like, if, if we're going with the simplest explanation, I, I don't think that's that's an accurate representation of what, like, Occam's razor would say. We go with the simplest explanation that is necessary to explain all the data. So, like, sure, we go with the simplest explanation, but if it doesn't explain all the data, then we, we have to posit something more. I mean, that's why we don't posit an Aristotelian version of cosmology because it's, it's simple, but it doesn't explain all the necessary data. So sure, simple is great, but if it doesn't explain all the data, would it, you agree that it's not the best explanation then? Correct. I would agree. Okay. So then like when I presented my arguments, I specifically argued for properties of a mind. I, I looked at specific things in emergent space time, consciousness and whatnot. Um, so why would it be explained by naturalistic pantheism then? Well, your arguments are just false. Why? Uh, first argument you pres presented was the digital physics argument where space-time is emergent. Yep. That's a theory promoted by Nima Arkani Hamad, who is an atheist. And to quote Nima Arkani Hamad, he says, like most physicists, I am an atheist. So that the fact that space-time is emergent has nothing to do with the mind at all. It's a, just a, can be a, emergent from natural properties of the universe, which is in fact the consensus in physics. The consciousness perspective is a vast minority position. Okay. In fact, well, to go to your, that was your first argument. Your second argument yeah. was the consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, from presented by von Neumann and Wigner, 
No, no, I, Wigner, I, I, I formulated that one. I, it was based on their work. Right. So Wigner himself specifically said that he was wrong to apply um, uh, micro level things like uh, quantum physics to macro level things like consciousness. So he admitted that was wrong. And when the polls were taken, a physicist of this kind of position, it goes into single digits. Physicists just completely reject that consciousness has anything to do with okay, quantum well, physics. Okay. So, couple, yeah, couple things about that. Couple, a couple things Go about ahead. that. I mean, you mentioned one. I mean, that's there's there's not one physicist who has presented emergence. I mean, there's numerous. I mean, it goes back to like people like Leonard Susskind, Martin Rees, Mikio Kaku, Brian Green. I mean, it's not just coming from this well, this one guy you mentioned. I mean, yeah, he does. But I mean, like Herman Verlaine argues for this. I mean, there's numerous physicists that argue for emergent space time, and a lot of them theists. Like for example, Stephen Barr, for example. Um, so there are. This is not just coming from one physicist. It comes from multiple, and a lot of these seem to be a little bit of appeals to authority. I mean, I'm more interested in the evidence. When Einstein presented his special relativity, he put in a fudge factor because he couldn't deal with the idea that uh, space time would have a beginning point. I'm more interested in their actual evidence they present, not their philosophical conclusions. So, I mean, sure, they believe that, but for the same reason, I don't think Galileo was wrong just because the consensus was against him in his day. Right, the consensus says that evidence is false, it's wrong, and that the people interpreting it to being its evidence of conscience are just wrong. Like to quote David Chalmers, in any case, all versions of the interactionist dualism have the conceptual problem that suggests that they are all less successful at avoiding epiphenomenalism than they might seem, or at least have no better than the naturalistic dualism, even on the views, there is some sense in which the phenomenal is irrelevant. We can always subtract the phenomenal component from any explanatory account yielding a purely causal component. So the consensus in physics, most physicists are naturalists, most physicists are atheists. They just reject the, your interpretation of the evidence. So that doesn't mean the evidence is wrong. We don't go with, I mean, in 1950, most scientists rejected the Big Bang. I remember reading Stephen Barr setting a survey in his book on that. So just because the consensus was against it doesn't mean it was wrong. I mean, as, as, Max, Planck said, said, as Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. Just because some people reject it, like when the Big Bang came out, or like right now, there's still a majority of evolutionary biologists still holding the modern synthesis, even though a wealth of data and Evo Devo research has been showing that we need to update that to me to change it. I mean, just because there, that's the is, it doesn't mean the evidence is wrong. Let's focus on the evidence, not what we're told to think by people. Right. The way science progresses is by consensus. You have to convince the consensus. That's the way science progresses. Just the fact that one guy said so or a few people said so doesn't qualify as sufficient evidence. You have to so, convince the consensus. That's so how science you, progresses. So then by your logic, the, Earth, the geocentric model was correct in Galileo's day? Or I'm sorry, the, helo, or the geocentric model, yeah, was correct in Galileo's day. Because it was about consensus, then whatever the, whatever, whatever the I mean, that seems like an ad, ad populum fallacy of anything. No, because back then it was run by the church and they just dictated it by fiat. That's the current not true. Model, that's, that's just by how science progresses. Accurate. Sorry, the but I have to current, I have on that. If you read a book called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths, written by Ronald Numbers and several other historians, the idea that church was sort of like controlling science is a huge modern myth, started by one of the founders of Cornell University, um, wrote a book about it, and he just made up a lot of stuff. Ronald Numbers has corrected a lot of these historical inaccuracies. That's not accurate. Was Bruno Giordano burned at the stake or not for arguing that the world rotated around the sun? They were not burned for that. There is no evidence anyone was ever burned for practicing science. Check out Ronald Numbers' book. They were burned for- It just sounds like ad hoc reasoning because it seems like they singled out the people who argued this like Darwin and Bruno Giuliano. It wasn't just a random no. choice. They burned but again, this is irrelevant to the debate. Reasons. This is irrelevant to the debate. So going back to my point, most physicists, the way science progresses in today's society is by convincing the consensus in the scientific field, not just a guy published a paper that does not make it credible. You have to convince okay. the consensus. The consensus can be wrong though, wouldn't you agree? Yes, it can, but it's less likely to be wrong than a guy published a paper and says. Okay, well, I didn't. So I cited several papers. Right, several. that's still less than the consensus. So mine is still more supported than yours is. Um, I don't really care how many peep, how many votes we can take. I care about evidence, and that's what I like to focus on is the actual evidence. Um, another right, thing and I tend said, to take the position that the majority has a better understanding of the evidence than you do, or those few guys that publish the paper do. Okay, well, at, at the end of the day, I'm going to go on the evidence. I'm not going to be told what to think by a majority rule. Right. You I am too, and I'm going to go with the majority who understands it better than you do. Fine. You can claim that all you want, but if you can't actually present evidence or a better explanation, I can say I'm justified in saying I have the best explanation. You said something else. You said there, we, there's no such thing as top-down causation in science. Uh, no. What? You said something about top-down causation. The Looking at the world from a top-down perspective of looking for metaphysical absolutes is a wrong way to look at the world. Okay, well, the, I mean, they've, they've talked about top-down causation or control of visual processing in some published papers. 
I'm not talking about top down in the way you are. I'm saying metaphysical absolutes. You can't start with metaphysical absolutes. Well, who said we're doing that? I started with the evidence and build arguments from there. Right. I'm saying any type of metaphysical absolute, if you add it to a theory ever, it's immediately unsupported. So if you think your God is all powerful, you're immediately wrong. I didn't or you're immediately that. unsupported. That's fine. My introduction is in general against all cases of theism. So if you believe in a God that's all powerful, all knowing, all loving, personal, eternal, conscious, or any of those infinites, you're immediately unsupported. That yeah, wasn't a rebuttal. That was one. We present other arguments to back that up. We don't just argue from just asserted ad hoc. But I mean, the three right, arguments I'm focusing on are compatible with deism, theism, anything right now. I'm just arguing for basic theism. As I said, I'm a classical apologist. If I can't get you right. to see theism, I'm not going to go any further. Right. So again, my point is that no form of human knowledge can ever justify those kinds of absolute properties. They're completely ad hoc. Can you define what you mean by justify? Support, make it reasonable to believe with evidence or argument in some sense. Why, can, why can't I make arguments that are reasonable to believe based on the data? Because no form of human knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes. That was kind of and the point of the... Everything you just said cannot be justified because it's a metaphysical absolute. I never said any metaphysical absolute. What are you talking you about? Did. You just made an absolute claim. No, I didn't. I said no form of human knowledge, the limited kind that we currently have, which is not a metaphysical absolute. That it's sounds the like an knowledge that, yeah, No, because there could be other knowledge out there that could justify it that we just don't know about yet. Well, so it's, it's only possible. a claim about human knowledge, not a claim about all knowledge. It's possible, but I'm on, I don't care about what's possible. An equal, as you said in your previous talks, an equal number of things are possible. I care about what's the most probable explanation. That's why I argued for the most probable explanation tonight. Just because there are other possible explanations or just because there was a, we took a vote and not everyone agrees, that doesn't mean my arguments are wrong, just like it didn't mean Galileo was wrong. It would have been absurd right, if, so if the opponents of Galileo, the, uh, the, the, it was the Dominicans, yeah, the Dominicans, if they would have said, no, no, we're right because we got the consensus. I mean, actually, they didn't even argue that way. Okay, so again, my argument was that there, there is no evidence. There's no more probable explanation. They're all equally probable because all the arguments are false. They indicate the absolutes with zero precision. They indicate them they, with nothing, like the square root of a pork chop. That your argument is effectively the square root of a pork chop, therefore God. Why? It's completely not. Right, can because, you no form of human knowledge, because no form of human knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes. So go to, to go back to my example, all evidence of the natural world is not evidence there is no supernatural. Would you agree with that? So no form of knowledge can justify metaphysical absolutes is what you're saying? Yes. That Which is, is demonstrated by all of you. No, it's not. It's, it's an argument about human knowledge. The limited amount of human knowledge is not a claim about all knowledge. You're still making that claim that your human knowledge, my human knowledge, cannot justify metaphysical absolutes. Therefore, you cannot right, make that absolute claim. No, nope, that's an epistemic claim. Well, I reject it then. I don't agree with it then. If it's okay, just an epistemic that's, that's claim, that's just how you're determined knowledge. But that's not going to address which is justified, Which is justified by all of the problems in philosophy and science which prove it to be the case. That no known form of knowledge can indicate metaphysical properties. Like the problem of undetermination and induction and the problem of the criterion and the problem of universals and Agrippa's trilemma and the problem of easy knowledge. But None of those arguments, those all fail. All of your arguments fail for the reason of those. Likely or best explanation in metaphysics. Well, it means any argument that tries to indicate the metaphysical is just false. It does not do it. It cannot do it. It is the square root of a pork chop. Just what false. Is, what is your evidence that it actually is metaphysically false? That's a metaphysical claim. You're making metaphysical claims saying that they are metaphysically false. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, I'm saying it cannot support or justify the metaphysical claim. I'm not saying it is metaphysically false. I'm saying the evidence does not justify a metaphysical claim. Is it a metaphysical claim? No, it's not. It's an epistemic it. claim. No, you're making claims about metaphysics. You're saying we can't do X in metaphysics. And I'm saying, well, okay, that's a metaphysical claim. No, I'm saying we can't do X in our current limited epistemic knowledge. We could possibly do X if we had metaphysical knowledge. We do not have metaphysical knowledge. We have epistemic, limited knowledge. How do you knowledge. know we don't have metaphysical knowledge? That's a metaphysical claim. I don't. I can't prove that we don't. But you'd you have to actually justify that, that claim. I can, I can show that no form of human knowledge can justify that claim. If you think we can't have metaphysical knowledge, you cannot tell me I cannot have metaphysical knowledge. That's a claim about metaphysics. No, it's a burden of proof fallacy. You hold the burden of proof to justify your metaphysical claim. I can show that no form of human evidence can justify it. Okay, I'm not, I, you're seemingly confusing justification and absolute proof. I'm arguing for the best explanation. I'm not right, arguing. I'm like saying there is it. no best explanation. There is absolutely nothing that indicates those conclusions. Zero percent indication. There isn't the best explanation. They're all just unsupported completely and totally in every respect. Again, you're just you're making these absolute claims, and I don't see any evidence to accept these absolute claims. Again, those are all the problems, the biggest problems in philosophy and sciences, which is why science doesn't make those kinds of claims. 
Yeah, and the if, same and when we, applies, also apply to theology. The same reason when, science can't support metaphysical naturalism, theology can't support metaphysical supernaturalism or God. Okay, well, yeah, when, when epistemic schemics make that, I just invoke particularism. If you're going to make these absolute claims, you actually need to show that I should accept them. I mean, there's no reason for me to accept those absolute claims if I can't, if you can't show you can justify those claims by your own standard. It's pulling the rug out right out from under you. Unless you reject all of the commonly well understood and accepted problems in every field of knowledge, then that's a justification of why you should accept my conclusion. No, the problems in knowledge are just basically we can never absolutely prove something 100%. Doesn't mean we can't reason to something. I mean, this would be absurd if we, if we applied this in elsewhere. The problem isn't absolute certainty. The problem is a metaphysical absolute property. So I, I'm grant that you're totally fine in not saying you have absolute certainty there's a God. The problem is that you are applying absolute properties to a God. The absolute properties are what are necessarily unsupported. What absolute properties are you referring to? All powerful, all knowing, all good, uh, necessary divine aseity. Where did I say Perfect that in action. my presentation? You didn't. My my. First statement was an introduction. It was not a rebuttal. I was not rebutting your introduction. It was my introduction. Well, that's why I'm asking. I'm asking you now because we're in the discussion part. Right. So that was my introduction. Cool. That's yeah. my position. It has nothing okay. to do with your position at all. Okay, but this is not really addressing my arguments. You're just trying to make these absolute philosophical claims, which I reject. Because again, sure, there are problems in knowledge. We can never absolutely prove something other than the fact that I exist and I'm experiencing something. But that doesn't mean we can le at least reason to the best explanation. I mean. If, if, if what you're saying is true, I mean, we have to throw out dozens of scientific theories we can never absolutely prove because science doesn't deal in proof. Science doesn't even really deal in falsification anymore. If you read someone like Emery Lakatos or Paul Firebender, their wonderful book called For and Against Method. Again, you're confusing epistemology and ontology. I'm not saying the problem is absolute certainty. I grant we don't have absolute certainty. I'm totally okay with that. The problem is when you add absolute properties to a theory all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. If you add those to a theory, then you require absolute certainty or they're unjustified, essentially. No, you don't, because you're just, yep. you're just making an inference of the best explanation. If no, I because those can never be the best explanation. Those can never be the best explanation. Remember, go back to my analogy. All of the evidence of the natural world is not evidence. There is no supernatural. Why? Why is that the case? All of the evidence, that, say that again, all of the evidence of the natural world, given all of the evidence of the natural world, that does not indicate there is no supernatural. Why? It does not indicate there is no supernatural? So you, it, all of the evidence does not indicate naturalism is true, is what you're saying? Correct. Metaphysical naturalism. Okay. Actual naturalists will argue from evidence in the natural world. They'll make inferences to naturalism. Sure, they, uh, they understand they can't prove it. They understand they cannot prove there is no supernatural when you're a philosophical naturalist. But they still at least argue. And then the, the theist makes arguments, and then the naturalist makes counterarguments. We make objections. We're just arguing to the best explanation. We're not arguing for absolute certainty or that we can absolutely know or anything like that. I mean, anyone who so tries most, to make Kant, like, noumenal phenomenal distinction, says there's this absolute distinction, is making uh, an absolute claim about the nominal. And that's, you can't. You didn't answer my question. You didn't answer my question. Why I'm, is all of the evidence of the natural world not demonstra demonstrative that there is no supernatural? Okay, I, I was explaining. even the metaphysical naturalists don't agree that they all agree that there could be a supernatural out there that we haven't discovered yet. Every single one of them. Yeah, and I agree so, there could not be. I, I, but again, you're trying to say this sort of demonstrates. Like, why does the natural world not demonstrate naturalism is true? Because metaphysics, science, does not deal in absolutes. It's not deal in absolute proof. We argue to the best explanation. When a philosophical naturalist argues for naturalism, they don't argue that they're absolutely can prove this. No one may, claims that. Right. So if you said there is a God, if we had equal evidence for a God, that would not show there wasn't a greater God somewhere down the line that we haven't discovered yet, correct? Yeah, it's possible. Doesn't mean it's probable. Which means, which means if you made this statement that there is the God who was uncreated and there is by definition no other God, you hold the burden of proof to try and demonstrate that, correct? Uh, I hold the burden to show evidence, yeah. And just like the fact that there is no evidence, the, all of the evidence of the natural world doesn't prove there is no supernatural, doesn't even indicate there is no supernatural, the same thing applies to God. So all of these metaphysical claims are unsupported. That one's due to the problem of induction and the problem of determination. Yeah, but you, can't you, know you mentioned the problem of induction. That does not mean we can't do induction just because there is a problem of induction. That kind of supports my point. Just because we have a problem of induction, that does not mean we still cannot make inductive arguments. Correct. But again, you're confusing epistemology and ontology. You can't make metaphysical properties absolutes and justify those. You can't ever do it. It's not possible. I'm not saying Which is why science right. never does. I'm not saying that's why, the, uh, that's why theology is wrong. 
Why? You can never support absolute properties like all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. All, -knowing, all, -loving. all of those are out. Is it absolutely true theology is wrong? No, it's absolutely true that all human knowledge can't justify those things. Is that absolutely true? No, that's not absolutely true. It's true based on human knowledge, the current unknown human knowledge. It's so you're making, you're making an inference of the best explanation? I'm making a deductive explanation of all human knowledge, which is limited. That's exactly like what I'm saying. I presented deductive arguments. And none of your deductive arguments work. They all fail, and I can prove they fail by saying, oh, look, they fall into this problem, which eradicates that explanation. So that How? doesn't indicate anything. I because of the big problems. Yeah. The they prove they do not indicate your conclusion. The I do. reason scientists don't ever make these claims is because they provably false. They do not indicate anything. Scientists don't make these Sci claims? No, scientists do not add metaphysical properties to things like that. Yes, we have they to, by definition. Metaphysics has to be involved in science. That's just the basis of understanding basic philosophy of science. Have no, you it doesn't. Read? Instrumentalism is one example that's just false. No, you don't. Phenomenalism is another example. You don't need to do that. Have you read for against AJR that? rejected metaphysics completely. No, you don't. What is the basic tenets of, what are the basic uh, parts of science? What are the basic parts of science? Three parts. Uh, I would just go with some way to differentiate between our imagination and our experience. We need some methodology to demonstrate that. I know that if you look at philosophy of science, the basic three parts would be shaping principles, data, and theories. We always start with shaping principles. That's why when we look at the moon, we don't think like Aristotle did that it was an intelligent being. We all have these metaphysical prejudices. That's how we look at data. From the data, we build theories, and then theories reshape our shaping principles. Theories are conceptual, data is empirical, uh, shaping principles are metaphysical, and they're always working in conjunction with other. This is separate, something Emery Lakatos points out when he's responding to people like Paul Feyerabend that are anti-realists and say something that the crazy stuff that like science is art, and you know, or Thomas Kuhn, who sort of flirts with that idea at some points. But the, the, the idea that we don't have these metaphysical prejudices in science is just not backed by philosophy of science. Yeah, it is. It actually is. You're just wrong about that. So again, wow. all science agrees on this. You can't ever add those metaphysical properties or your conclusion is immediately unsupported. It's why science doesn't do it. It's why theology is wrong and why everyone rejects it in science for the most part. You keep making you can't add those metaphysical claims properties. that theology is wrong and, I, and then you right. keep saying, I can't make absolute claims. I'm it's confused. Right, because I'm not making an absolute claim about all knowledge in the universe. You are. I'm making an epistemic claim about the limited amount of human knowledge. That can be justified. Your claim about all possible knowledge, that can't be justified. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is the best explanation. I'm not saying that I'm making claims right. about absolute all knowledge. You can't ever claim an absolute metaphysical property is the best explanation. Not supportable. That is an absolute, though. I mean, you can't... Nope, that's a claim about human knowledge. That is an epistemic claim about human knowledge, which can be justified. Your it's claim cannot be justified. Claim. It can be justified. It's an absolute metaphysical claim about what humans can do with their knowledge. That is an absolute metaphysical claim about what we can do with epistemology. It's not an epistemic claim. It's a metaphysical claim You're about equivocating epistemology. between two different kinds of metaphysics. Just ignore that. It doesn't even apply to my argument. It doesn't refute anything I've said. So again, we can justify claims about human knowledge because we have access to human knowledge. We cannot justify claims about metaphysical knowledge. We don't have access to metaphysical knowledge, except for things like I think therefore I am. What metaphysical... Just arguing this is a metaphysical thing is irrelevant to the argument. We don't have access to metaphysical evidence, is what you're saying. Correct. That's why I gave empirical evidence. I relied on data that it was presented in peer-reviewed papers, and I argued for the best explanation from that. No form of empirical evidence qualifies as metaphysical evidence. Doesn't okay. Category. Doesn't. That's a metaphysical claim. No, that's an empirical claim. That is a metaphysical claim for sure, because you can't empirically not. study that. You can't empirically find that. That's a, that is a shaping principle you have. There, you're, you're, you're forcing your shaping principles and it, trying to no, say it that, would only be, no, it would only be a metaphysical claim if I claimed we would never be able to. We could potentially in the future be able to, so it's not a metaphysical claim. You said we absolutely claim. cannot. With the current limited knowledge we have, it would only be a metaphysical claim if I said we could never do this. Okay, but you're saying, you said earlier, absolutely that we cannot have access to this. That is an absolute with claim. Current, only with our current human knowledge. It is not an absolute claim. It would only be an absolute claim if I said it, was, it will never be possible. Okay, but the problem is, is that that is such an absolute claim, and there's no reason to it. There's no there's empirical absolute, evidence. To again, that. no, no. Again, your claim applies to all knowledge. There is a being who was not created. My claim only applies to human knowledge. This should there should this should be an obvious difference, extremely obvious. My claim only applies to human knowledge. Your claim applies to all the universe's knowledge. Your claim is unsupported. Mine is not unsupported. I'm making metaphysical claims. I accept that. I'm arguing from the evidence of the best explanation. You're making metaphysical claims about humans are capable with our current knowledge. No, that you're equivocating language. I'm just going to say you're wrong. Stop. I mean, yeah, my I claim, claim you wrong, but... 
My claim <laughs> only applies to human knowledge. Your claim applies to all knowledge. Yours is unsupported. Mine is not unsupported. This is purely obvious. There's a different no. different quality of evidence required to justify these two claims. They're not the same. You keep trying to equivocate them. You're wrong. Okay, I'm just going to interject for one second, and the reason I'm interjecting is because the people in the chat who are watching are, are asking for a little bit of clarification of what the differentiation might be between metaphysical knowledge and natural or empirical knowledge. Please, that'd be um, helpful. That would be really, right, really so helpful I, to the people watching. So in my introduction, I defined metaphysical claims as stopping points for truth where there is, by definition, not something beyond it. The would fundamental you, nature of reality. Beyond it. To ensure that you're both on the same page, Mike, would you accept that definition? Um, I need him to clarify a little bit more about it because I don't think I do. I'm a little suspicious. What we what, what just said. Let's work on that too because I feel like you guys might be talking past each other and it's confusing for the people that are watching. So if we could just agree upon at least that point, I think that's a better starting point for the conversation going forward if that's okay with you too. Sure, clarify. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. All right, so I define metaphysics as the fundamental nature of reality, which is a stopping point for truth where there is no more truth to discover beyond it. Beyond it. So it's only the final truths. Okay, so if it's only yeah. a tentative claim, all of the stuff we currently know, that's not a metaphysical claim. It's only a metaphysical claim if it's an absolute claim where there is nothing beyond it. No, I, I don't think that's absolutely true. I mean, I think metaphysical, you can make metaphysical claims and then not say that there's nothing beyond this. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of confused on where you're going with that. I mean, sure, metaphysical claims are about the whole nature of reality. Uh, I mean, is theism, naturalism, can we even know if these things are true or not those are all metaphysical claims but i'm confused what you mean that we can't they have to be like absolute i mean i don't think anyone says they have to be absolute so to take methodological naturalism as the position we have no reason to believe in the supernatural we only have reason to believe in the natural metaphysical naturalism is the position there is only the natural so that's a metaphysical claim because it's metaphysical naturalism it claims there is nothing beyond it there is only the natural methodological naturalism does not claim that so you can dif differentiate between the metaphysical claims and the methodological claims. The metaphysical ones are absolute claims where there's nothing beyond this. The methodological claims are not. Well, methodological naturalism is a method. It, I mean, you can be a theist and be a methodological naturalist. Right. So it's essentially we have no reason or no justifiable method to demonstrate there is anything but the natural. I, I like that, the quote from Lyle Shanks in his debate with, uh, I forget who he debated. Are you, are you saying methodological naturalism claims that we cannot make claims about the metaphysical? Methodological naturalism is a method that we can use to determine the natural. We don't have a method that we can use to determine the supernatural. Okay, well, yeah, that's just one method. It's not even accepted by all philosophers of science, even at that. I mean, it's accepted just by most it's a method for studying the natural world. It's, 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 a, it's actually a philosophical shaping principle. It's a shaping principle. It's how you ought to view the world. And it's metaphysical in that sense. No, it's not. It has nothing to do with metaphysics at all. Absolutely. I mean, that's what the methodological naturalism not metaphysical naturalism. They have a word for the metaphysical naturalism. It's called metaphysical naturalism. Well, you can't discover and methodological naturalism. You have to assume that principle. It's not assumed at all. Yeah, it is. That's no, it's not. The very basis of the philosophy we, of science. We cannot discover the no, science. It's false. That's immediately false. That's immediately false. Refuted by every scientific, every sci philosopher of science out there. It's been repeatedly debunked. Metaphysical, methodological naturalism is just that we have a method to demonstrate the natural. Yeah, as soon as it doesn't yeah. refute the, the supernatural, there could always be a supernatural. And if we discovered it, then there would be a methodological supernaturalism. It does not assume there is no such thing. It just shows we have no way to demonstrate there is such a thing. Right. I never said the methodological naturalism says that. It's a method, though, but it is a metaphysical principle that people impose when they're trying to do science. It's a shaping principle. You just, you just said that it assumes there is no supernatural. That's false. If I did, then I misspoke. No, I, it doesn't say anything about that. It's a method. Right, but it's not, and it's not metaphysical. It has nothing to do with metaphysics. It says nothing about the fundamental nature of reality. It just Definitely says this is a, has nothing to say about metaphysics at all. The Completely underlying irrelevant. principles that impose methodological naturalism on how we do science is philosophical in nature. It's a metaphysical uh, principle on how we ought to study the natural. No, it's a method, and the method can change. Yeah, it has nothing we, to do with metaphysics. But there's no empirical evidence to, to prove that methodological naturalism is how we ought to behave or how we ought to do science. Right. If it did, that would make it metaphysical. No, that would make it empirical. If we had actual scientific evidence to show that this principle was true. No. Uh, metaphysics is the fundamental nature of reality. It's beyond, beyond empirical. Empirical isn't metaphysical. Yeah, I'm, but I mean, we're talking about methodological naturalism. That's a principle we assume. We impose. I mean, the scientific method cannot be discovered by the scientific method. We have to assume that is true. This is what basic philosophy of science 101 is about. You just can't assume the, the, the scientific method is somehow empirical and therefore true and absolute. 
it has to be assumed. And this is a philosophical, this is a metaphysical uh, shaping principle that we start with. It's not assumed at all. It's just a method that we try and see if it works. We, we assume the method, yeah. No, it works. We demonstrate it works. We don't have to assume it works. We can't demonstrate it works. We can only make inductive arguments that it works. Right, and that gives us good reason to believe it works because they work, because it shows success. Exactly. So we can do induction, we can do deduction, we can do all these sorts of things. I'm just doing the same thing. That is my argument. But we can't ever make metaphysical conclusions about the nature of reality using those ever. It, why would I accept that absolute truth? Well, give me one good empirical reason. It's I not an absolute that. truth. It's just a truth about human knowledge. It's an epistemic claim. That is definitely an absolute truth. You are again. This, this should be really, concept. really simple for you to understand that my claim only applies to the limited amount of human knowledge, and your claim applies to all knowledge. There's a huge difference there. It should be super obvious. Well, no, I'm talking about our knowledge too, because we can't get beyond our knowledge. We can't be, get beyond our subjective experience in that sense. So I'm talking about what we can find with our human knowledge and what we can make inferences with our human knowledge. Right, and you seem to not realize there's a contradiction there that with our limited human knowledge, we can justify claims about all possible knowledge. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we can make, make an all-powerful being that wasn't created. Those would be metaphysical claims that cannot be justified with human knowledge. We can make good inferences based on our knowledge, though, on what is the most can't likely. Can't make any inferences at all. No yes. more likely at all. Why are you keep making these absolute claims? Like, you, what do you mean we can't make inferences? Well, they're not, again, you keep, you keep making the same mistake of confusing epistemology with metaphysics. I mean, this, this is just, I mean, I would highly recommend you check out a book by Thomas Nagel, who's an atheist called I'm the sorry, Lab. you're just wrong. It's just it's not, even, not even something I can take seriously. I mean, so to go back, gonna... let's go back to your argument. Digital physics is wrong because Nima Akarni Hamad and many of the physicists who support it, most physicists are atheists, most reject that it has anything to do with the mind and comes from a natural cause. Consciousness, the Wigner example, again, mostly rejected by physicists wrong. Wigner himself rejected it. And then the information, the introspective argument was your third argument, argument from ignorance. It was, it's, it's a more parsimonious explanation to say that mind is explained by some physical force we haven't discovered yet than hypothesizing an entirely new category, ontological category of thing. So again, the naturalism is a simpler explanation. Okay, well, let me also just, accepted by most academics. Let me offer a rebuttal to all those really quick. Okay, the first two arguments, consensus is an ad populum fallacy. It doesn't change anything. An argument from ignorance would be saying, the, uh, God exists because it cannot be proven false. Just making a, an actual deductive argument is not an argument from ignorance. And if you're going to say that it's more likely that the, the consciousness emerges from the brain, I actually need to see some evidence that consciousness emerges from the brain. I mean, I, I have seen materialists have made several huge protestable predictions, which have turned out to be false. Okay, so on the last one, uh, yeah, you've rephrased the argument from ignorance to make it seem like not an argument from ignorance. I can do the same with anything like lightning. How is it There's an no argument? difference. It's, uh, it's because we can't explain it, and you then assume it's not natural, or that there's some fundamentally different thing, just because we can't explain it. With the How is that not assuming naturalism? You're assuming the conclusion you want. It's got to be natural, or else it's an argument from ignorance. Because everything we've discovered in the universe so far has been natural, and so we have good inductive reason that this will also be natural. Just like assuming we don't explain, we couldn't explain lightning 3,000 years ago, the best explanation is it's an undiscovered natural thing, not so that there's a new category of reality to explain it. So you're presupposing naturalism, and, and no matter what the evidence says, it has to be natural because you're presupposing naturalism. No, I'm not presupposing anything. There is more evidence for naturalism than anything that isn't natural. Well, you've not given any. Science. Science does not all indicate. Science. Didn't you just say earlier that naturalists could not use the natural world to justify naturalism, and now you're saying science has justified that all that exists is natural? No, I'm saying that we have more empirical evidence that the things that we see in the world are probably going to be explained by natural causes than a new category of thing which we have no evidence to support at all. Okay, well, I gave evidence to support it. Your evidence was wrong. I just proved that wrong. So, do you have you any didn't other evidence? Just the evidence. You argued from consensus. With an ad populum fallacy, you confuse what an appeal to authority, appeal to ignorance is. I mean, no, none of these are. This is just assuming naturalism, and then when a new evidence comes about, no, 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 that can't lead to anything other than natural because we know naturalism is already true because we have all this evidence for naturalism. But I'm not going to give any because we already know naturalism is true. This is just assuming naturalism. Uh, no, that's objectively false. It's like if we if we have a box and we pull out a red marble, red marble, red marble, the most reasonable conclusion is the next one's going to be a red marble. If you say okay. it's going to be a different model that we've never seen before, that's not evidence. Well, that's, that's a, the argument of ignorance. That's a caricature of my arguments. I would be saying that I have actually pulled out a blue marble, and here's the evidence for it. Here's the like I get. I gave evidence in three arguments, and your only reply seems to be consensus, consensus, consensus. Science works based on consensus. That's a valid argument. No, science works on, uh, as Emery Lakatos notes, science works on progressive and degenerate research programs. Every research program has a core 
as an auxiliary hypothesis, which helps move it along. Um, and these are things that kind of move things forward and backwards. There's multiple paradigms. As even Thomas Kuhn notes, re scientific revolutions are basically quasi-religious. They don't happen instantly. These take times for things that we're seeing it right now in evolution. Because a lot of scientists are starting to say the modern synthesis needs to be updated. And other scientists are saying, no, it doesn't. So there's a very interesting debate happening between Evo Devo researchers and neo-Darwinists. I mean, this doesn't happen instantly. This is research programs are progressive. I would highly recommend the book For and Against Method by Emery Lakatos and Paul Feyerbein. Right, and I just say you're wrong. Science works based on consensus. I mean, what you're just saying is just ad hoc. It's like, no. I mean, no, I'm actually appealing to philosophy of science books. I don't know what to tell you, and you're just saying I'm wrong because that's ad hoc. No, I'm saying that science works based on consensus. We know it does. That is not, that is, I would, what philosopher of science has said that? I can definitely find you some quotes and email them to you later. I mean, yeah, consensus no. is very useful, but that's not how science works. If that was how science works, we'd never change anything because the consensus would always just be like, yep, this is what we're sticking to. We would never move from geocentricism to heliocentricism. We would never have moved from thinking the entire universe was the size of our own galaxy to the vast size it is now because consensus would have said, nope, we can't change because this guy called Albert Einstein published a paper somewhere. We can't change. Uh, that's not as you, as you just noted a few minutes ago, actually, it does change. It do, yeah, exactly, because it's not based on consensus. It's based on evidence. It's based on shaping principles, data. Which data, moves data. the consensus. The evidence moves the consensus. Yeah, and the paradigm is just the people in the field data. understand the evidence yeah, better the, than we do. Yeah, that's why I relied on a lot. So of it's people. probably a pretty reasonable conclusion to go with the consensus in the scientific fields, Look, because they probably can, understand this. Look, at the end of the day, you can believe whatever you want. You can have faith in whatever you want. I choose to follow evidence. I choose to follow the evidence. You seem to be following just a ad hoc offshoot of some minority position that isn't well supported. That's what it looks like to me. Well, I gave a lot of evidence for my position. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, if I have all the evidence, right, you're not giving me any evidence for naturalism. I don't have to tell you. Right. Well, I just gave the consensus, which says you're wrong. I don't really care. And for the same reason, okay. I, would have, I wouldn't have cared in the 1950s when the majority of scientists rejected the Big Bang. Right. You can just pick any ad hoc paper that some crazy scientist published and say, ah, I have evidence of this theory. Well, science doesn't care about your feelings. Sorry. Yeah, well, they, Convince they, this they, consensus. Go, they, they respond to those and they debunk those if they're crazy. Like, take, take young Earth creationism. We both dealt with Which is exactly what happened with your examples, which is why Wigner rejected his own hypothesis of the consciousness collapse. Which is why the digital physics argument is rejected and has nothing to do with consciousness as most physicists are atheists. Again, Nimar Kahneman presents a more physical, fundamental thing where space time emerges from. It has nothing to do with consciousness. Look, if you're just extending the natural beyond space time, you're just going to make theists happy. I mean, Johann and Roth calls himself a naturalist, and he's a theist. I mean, if you're just saying that what space time emerges from is also natural, okay, fine. That does not prove that, that does not even remotely show my arguments are incorrect. If you're just going to extend natural beyond that, uh, I'm not following your argument. So, if we can show that the space-time emerges from a more natural, fundamental thing that isn't consciousness or has no property of consciousness in the theory, wouldn't well, that it, refute it your... Could, then no, yeah, my argument would be debunked, but you haven't done that. I mean, but... If, that's if, the Mark Hamad's theory. That's what it does. Go read his he theory. speculates that it emerges from more natural to things, but, I mean, that doesn't show that he's right, and he's just speculating, as you even said. Right, and all the guys that you're published are also just speculating. So which, where do we, how do we show which one is better than the other? We make general inferences based on the data that we have. This is how we work with data, theories, and our shaping principles, as I said. I prefer I to go with the general inferences made by the professionals in the field who really understand it. The consensus in the field seems to be like a more reliable way to go than trying to make a judgment based off our limited knowledge. Well, I relied on experts. I relied on numerous sources in there. I have numerous sources in my, in my videos. That's why I, I constantly put this in the video description all my sources so people can fact check me right and i just gave you sources that contradict those so again how do we determine which one is more supported i say go with the consensus seems pretty reasonable i'm not gonna just follow blindly and believe whatever i'm told to think i'm gonna look at data and, and challenge things this is how i mean take for example uh stephen jay gould stephen jay gould was a functionalist in terms of evolution and then it, towards the end of his life he became a structuralist he rejected the consensus because the evidence convinced him and he wrote a very extensive and interesting book on it I mean, we, we just can't, if he would have just said, no, I got to stick with what the consensus tells me to think, that would have been an absurd way to do science. That's not how this works. Right. And if we were actually writing papers and doing research in this field, then that would be reasonable. We're not. 
We just have to go with what the authorities say. So we can cherry pick a few papers that support our position on both sides, or we can go with the consensus. It seems like the consensus is more supported from both of our perspectives. Let's just go with what the authorities say. If the Bible says it's true, that's enough for me. I mean, it's kind of said what it sounds like. Why can't we well, think that's of exactly what, that reason? That seems like exactly what you're doing. You're just cherry picking a few authorities that seem to re resupport your your prior conceived position, and right. I can just pick different authorities that have a different conclusion. It doesn't make any difference there. Great, let's do that. Show me the evidence they present. Let's see what better explains reality. Let's see what's mo more parsimonies. Do it. Let's go. We can definitely do that. Let's go with Neymar Connie Helmod's paper. Yeah, he's or you I say, just say the physicists have already done this and they've been doing this for years and the consensus is is that your position is weaker. Okay, why is it weaker? The professionals have done this. They have come to this conclusion. We could wow. do it too. We could go through the years and years of papers and work to support this, or we can say these people have already done it. No, no, that's not how we do this. We can we can look and we can read the books. We can read this stuff. We can study this. I mean, I contact experts when I'm able to. I, I email Fred Kuttner all the time because I want to know more things, okay? We don't just blindly go, oh, now the consensus said it. If it gets to 51%, then I'll maybe change my view. But until then, I'm just going to stick with it. That's an ad populum fallacy. We go on evidence. We don't go on what we're told to think. I don't believe in photons because I built a Large Hadron Collider and actually saw one. I believe okay. in photons because it was done by the experts in the field. Yeah. And there's a consensus in the field about these things existing. And they they understand the evidence. They can make it right. So the same thing applies to this just like it does to that. The consensus in the field, photons exist. The consensus in the field is naturalism. Okay, that's a philosophical claim, though, isn't it? Naturalism, what you're talking about? The consensus is that... Methodological naturalism, not metaphysical naturalism. Okay, that's just a method. That's just a method. Right. You can be a theist and be right. a methodologist. Because we, we, have, we have a method to demonstrate natural things. We do not have a method to demonstrate supernatural things. So we go yes. with the method that can demonstrate things exist. Yeah, same way we would do it with historical claims. We, do, we use explanatory scope, planetary power, at least ad hoc, the most plausible, provide illumination. We just make inferences, as we have done since Plato. We make inferences to the best explanation. Right, I would agree. And, but those and can never be for a new category of things we have no evidence for, like the supernatural. So we can know that there are new categories. That there, the, the evidence in the natural world in, implies that there are these other categories. These are these other things based on what we see now. Like I did, like with emergent space-time. Well, I refuted that and showed the consensus says you're wrong. Other physicists say you're wrong. So okay. I have I have justified reason to say you're wrong on that. It's not a refutation. Just the fact, just that, saying, you, I, the fact I, that you cherry pick a few papers from people that seem to support your position isn't evidence. That's not a refutation. That's saying I was told to think this way by these people. Therefore, I'm right. I don't care what you were told no, to think. You have papers evidence. that told you to believe this based on the evidence they presented, and I have papers that told me to believe the opposite based on their evidence. Okay, what evidence? Let's go over it. Let's see which is the best explanation. Okay, fine. Let's go through Neymar Carney Hadamad's papers and the entire books that he's written. We can go through it step by step and show that this is the more supportive position. Okay, show me the evidence. What evidence does he present? I mean, I've gone through a lot of these papers, gone through a lot of these books, got, brought the facts up, put it in the PowerPoint presentation, put it in my, put it in my videos to show this is the best explanation. Can you please do the same for me? That's what I thought we were going to talk about tonight. All right, I could. That's going to take a while. Okay, it is. show that it is a better I'll explanation. I'll just send you the paper and you can read it. There you go. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to argue along the same lines. Now, what I've seen in some of his lectures is that he just speculates there'd be these more fundamental laws beneath us, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. That would not show that my arguments are wrong. In fact, they could very well just be compatible with them. Just because you're extending natural beyond space-time, that does not show my arguments are wrong. Uh, how so? What do you mean? Well, it, 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 I, I, sorry, say his name again. It's Nima Arkani Hamad. Nakani Hamad. I'm really bad at pronunciation. Uh, Nakani Hamad. Um, I mean, if his if he's just showing that space time is emergent from these more underlying fundamental laws, fine. I mean, that's what I'm arguing too. I mean, it seems like his argument would be just compatible with my point. I would just point out that this are the same properties that would be a mind, and therefore the universe is most likely emerged from a mind. So how do you get from more natural properties to it's a mind? Because how are you defining natural? I mean, as you know, you were in. Um, you're you're, you're uh, absolutely right. The definition between natural and supernatural is incredibly meaningless, essentially. So, so I I don't know how you go from if it's just more natural properties. Well, let's just drop the, Let's just drop the labels completely. I don't really care if it's supernatural or natural. I'm just arguing that there is a God exists based on the data that we do have. I don't really care if you want to call it supernatural or natural. As I said, Johann and Roth calls himself a naturalist and he's a theist. I don't really care what you want to if you, what you want to label it if it's a supernatural god or if it's a natural god because it'd be uh, compatible with uh, um, 
uh, Narkani Hamad's uh, work, fine, whatever. That still does not show that God does not exist or there's, there's no reason to believe in God. Right. His model does not have any inclusion of any kind of consciousness, anything. Right, because it's so a model. That, the emergent, so the emergent space-time can be explained by non-conscious additions. I, I would it argue seems like that, that is the underlying principles, we can make the philosophical inference that, that it is a mind. That's what I did in my opening statements. Sure, in the scientific papers, you're not going to see that because they're not making philosophical inferences like you would see in a philosophy journal. I would prefer to go with the physics journals than the philosophy ones. I would prefer to go with both so we get a better understanding of reality. Let's read what everyone is saying, if we can. I mean, it would be wonderful, but, you know, let's try to get a full, better picture. Study philosophy, study physics. Let's go with both. That's what I try to do. I, I study the physics and I make philosophical inferences. I would say that the physics journals are probably a lot more relevant and the philosophy ones really aren't that relevant at all. The Why? physics. Because it doesn't seem like physics is or philosophy is relevant to the field of physics. That doesn't contribute anything to the field of physics for the most part. No, it, it absolutely does. Haven't you heard of philosophy of science? Right, but it doesn't contribute anything to physics. It doesn't provide any testable predictions or any scope of the, what's currently going on in physics. It pre looks at the data, looks at the theories, and it makes philosophical inference from this. And this helps shape contribute the shaping principles, gets us a better understanding of philosophy of science. I mean, we need to read people like Emery Lakatos because he did an excellent job responding to the anti-realists and refuting the idea, or not really refuting, but addressing the idea that it's claimed by like Paul Firebender that science is art and that we shouldn't accept that. And he gives really good reasons and really good arguments. This is really been, this is really helpful for science. This is a good thing. Right, I agree. Philosophy of science is really important for the first stages of science, but it doesn't add anything to the current stages. Like, you're not going to get a theory of quantum physics from philosophy. It's yeah, only going to come from physics. Right. So it doesn't, from, from, from my perspective, that means it doesn't add anything to the modern in, incarnation of physics. That's why I'm saying I'm making a metaphysical... Progress. I'm using the physics and I'm making a metaphysical argument. I'm not, I'm not hate that at all. Okay. And so I would go back to what I said earlier about the argument from ignorance. It seems like it's more reasonable to just conclude that it's more natural stuff and not some kind of new consciousness thing. Why? Because Why of induction, all, all of this. Because it seems like all the things we've all discovered throughout all of time have followed this pattern of, nat of um, I don't know what a better word to use, just natural, go with natural. Uh, all of the discoveries we've made in the past have followed the natural scientific kind of explanations, and we haven't had any kind of what would normally be classified as supernatural minds or something outside of the universe. Well, you're it assuming seems like that. A more, well, it seems that's not an assumption. We can go back to all of the discoveries in science. They all seem to be uh, natural scientific explanations, not well, minds. Well, they are going to be. It's science. Science only studies a natural world. Of course, we're only going to find natural explanations in science. Right, so you would have to come up with a different methodology to show that there is some kind of something outside of that. Yeah, we have a methodology to show these natural things. We don't have a methodology, as far as I know, to indicate this other class of thing. I mean, there is philosophical methodology. I mean, as I said, we argue to the best explanation, what's the most parsimonious, what's the most probable. The same, the same basic features that Plato would have used to argue for his position. Right, and my position is the most parsimonious, most probable is always going to be the kind of naturalistic scientific explanation and never going to be adding this new consciousness thing in. Why? I mean, if that's the case, you're always just going to assume naturalism. You're never going to be open to the changing your mind or new evidence. If you're just going to assume it's always got to be natural. Because it seems more parsimonious and better explains the things and it's more probable as an explanation. So then if I give evidence and arguments that there is something, that there is a, a universal mind through the arguments, then you can't just reply, no, no, it's natural because other things have shown to be natural. Well, if I can explain the same evidence with natural explanations without any kind of supernatural thing, then yes, those would not therefore be evidence of the supernatural. That's my problem, is that there <laughs> hasn't been. What? There hasn't been. Hasn't been what? There hasn't been any good evidence to suggest that the arguments that I'm giving can be explained by natural. Well, I just gave you one, Nima Arkani Hamad. That was your first one. The second one was that Wigner himself rejected his theory. So there are good evidences to reject that those indicate the conclusion you're okay. asserting. I don't really care what, what, his, uh, what, he, what he changes his mind. I don't care about the evidence presented. And again, as I said, the, the, the guy you're presenting, his arguments, it seems like it's completely compatible. He's just saying the space time is emergent, and he's speculating it could be these more uh, fundamental natural laws. Great. Johan Rotz calls himself a naturalist, and he's a theist. Who cares? Everything is always compatible with any theory. You can always just add it on at the end. You tack it on. So it's never going to find something that's what you're doing right, right now. All right, I'm going to interject just because we hit the 45-minute mark, and there was a, there was a, a lull. 
<laughs> that I thought I could squeeze in there. Uh, if you guys are comfortable with it, we are going to move on to the Q and A. Sure. Are, are it's okay. You felt like you you sure. passed out. All yeah. right. Perfect. That Thank you. That was really fascinating. I enjoyed it. I have I have questions, but I'm going to try not to be selfish because the chat was on fire for most of it. <laughs> Maybe later. I'll, I'll Facebook message Mike. <laughs> like sure, yeah. questions. That consciousness thing is fascinating to me. That's an argument I haven't been introduced to before. And I'm a, I'm a brain girl, so that's interesting. I'll, I have questions for you about that. So James, do you have everything organized and ready? You want to explain how the Q&A is going to work? I do. Thank you very much. I cannot believe, first of all, how exciting this debate has been. The arguments, uh, just the depth, and as well as I think that both of these debaters have a really strong ability in being able to take challenging concepts and teach uh, and explain them to people who may be new to it. So we that's why uh, one of the reasons why we love having you guys. And I'm also excited with my heart beating super fast because we've had a ton of questions, which is great. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with them over here. I'm like, oh my gosh. So here we go. Uh, first, I want to say uh, thanks so much for Super Chat. So usually what we do is we'll read the Super Chats first. Super Chat can be a question or a comment towards one of the debaters, and then we'll let the debater uh, respond. And uh, otherwise, for Q&A, if you, if you have a question, but you, you're like, I'm not doing a Super Chat, totally cool. Just put an at Modern Day Debate and then your question into the comments, and that will make it a little bit easier for me to see it. So... Here we go. Thanks so much. J School account. I just want to say thanks so much for your super chat. Um, I think this is just a, a gift to the channel. Uh, he didn't write anything or she didn't write anything. So we want to say thanks so much for your super chat. We totally appreciate it. And then also just letting everybody know, Shannon and I will be alternating back and forth and we're first reading through the super chats and then we were going to start with the other questions as well. All right. Oh, that, I guess that means it's my turn. Yes. <laughs> so Aisha Miles. Thank you, Aisha. So, oh, sorry, it went up. T-Jump is a powerhouse logic and reason for the win. And so you got a fan there, Tom? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tom's got a fan. Appreciate the compliment. So we had a lot of fans in the super chats and in the comments for both parties. So uh, yeah. uh, thanks so much, Aisha. That's a really generous super chat. I totally appreciate it. Adam Friended, thanks so much for your super chat, buddy. Uh, totally appreciate it. And he said, Michael is a badass. So you got a fan as well, Michael. <laughs> and Snake was right. Why does universe need a beginning, but God doesn't? And that one sounds like a question for you guys. Anybody? Yeah. Great, yeah. great question. That's addressed a lot. I have a video called The Worst Objection to Theism, Who Created God? Similar to that. Uh, basically, as Tom even said in his opening statements, we have to believe something is necessary, something, the first cause, the first thing, which all of the contingent things are all dependent on. Um, he might say it's naturalistic pantheism. I'm going to say it's God, but we would agree that something necessary has to exist. That's why we would say that God does it. Now, the reason why we say the universe does is because there's scientific evidence that suggests the universe does. So, I mean, Tom can chime in if he disagrees or wants to say anything else, sure. Yeah, so there's there's evidence that our known universe had a beginning in the Big Bang. Now, that could just go back to a cyclic universe like Neil Turek proposes or the multiverse like Sean Carroll proposes, and those could just be infinite, just kind of like a god is. So it could be that the the universe itself is internal in some sense, but our known universe definitely must have had some kind of a beginning. Okay, fair enough. Gotcha. Thank Tag you. Your Thank you for your answers and thank you for your questions. So next, Patrick Jane, thanks so much for your super chat. And he says, check out theologyforums.com. So totally appreciate it, Patrick Jane. He's been a debater here before. So uh, good to see you, Patrick. All right. And now Genesis, or no, sorry, Genius Tracks. I'm dyslexic, so this is, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Token, friend of the show donation. Good jobs, James, Shannon, Mike, and Tom. Thank you. That is so nice. Yeah, that's very sweet. That's really, really kind. That's, we hope that, so even though I know it's like Mike and Tom are totally disagreeing, I have a feeling that had these guys bumped into each other, like after this, if they were in person, they'd be like, hey, yeah, you want to go like have a soda or something? So soda. that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> Every, it's like, you know what? Everybody's like, oh, let's, we'd have a beer. I'm like, that's becoming Jay, cliche. No good, no good philosophy conversations happen at a Jamba Juice. They happen at a bar <laughs> over a shot of whiskey. I want a soda. So, okay, next one. Thank you very much. That's right. Michael has a tradition of, which is it that you usually drink every show? 
I, I, I'm, I like to change it up. Tonight I'm drinking Glenn Levitt 12-year, uh, but I have a, a couple I like. I got, I got a no bond. I'm really getting into scotches right now, but I also like rye whiskey. So, A sophisticated man. So, Thank you. <laughs> you bet. So uh, next, uh, Logos Theos, thanks so much for your super chat. And he says, and we remember we'll let you uh, respond because sometimes it's a, a slight jab. He says, uh, Tom, you're wrong. Study philosophy of science 101. Yeah, Tom. You don't have to. Res- you don't have to respond, <laughs> but if you want to respond, it's up to you. I like cheese. <laughs> you got it. Fair enough. All mm-hmm. right. So Snake was right. A mind does not a god make. A mind does not a god make. So there could be a mind that created the universe that isn't the god. Yeah. I mean, I would just say that is God, though. I mean, I'm, I don't. I don't say. I feel. I feel like that would be, he'd be arguing backwards. I would try to look at the evidence and then argue to what it is, and then we just call that God. That's what I do in several of my videos, several of my arguments. We don't start with God and then try to make it fit. We go evidence, evidence, and we infer to a mind. This mind is what we call God. That's why I said in my my specific premises, this mind is what we call God. It's just a title. It doesn't have to even be there. You can call it whatever you want. I have a follow-up question then. So aren't you essentially just saying that um, whatever started the universe is God, regardless of any other properties? I mean, you could take that route. Now, if it turned out to be something natural, something non-conscious, then I don't, don't know if I would say that is God. I definitely want to be the Christian God, obviously. Does consciousness negate uh, natural? Like, so if I'm conscious, but also natural, I would say. So can something be conscious and natural and start the universe, for example? Yeah, it's possible. I, I would argue, though, is that if it, if it is natural, like I do this in my video on the digital physics argument, it would have to probably come from uh, reducible parts and build up. And so you just start creating a chain of events where that thing would have to be in a universe and mm-hmm. then it have to come from something else. Infinite so, regress. Infinite regress. Yeah. So eventually I would say as an idealist, that consciousness is fundamental and eventually you get back to a conscious mind. Now that, that, that obviously implies a longer explanation, which I can always get into in the future, but you check out my videos. I try to explain that. Me and you are going to be friends, I think. Cause I'm <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> if, if you say there's going to be scotch there, I'll come. Yeah. I'm a rum drinker, but I'll buy scotch. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. I got rum. I, I, I've I got, got a Florida a, can over there. You and I, I can talk. <laughs> that's a good one. I got a really good 18 year Kirk and Sweeney you'd probably like. Ooh. We can be friends. I changed it. We're good. We're fine. We can be friends. <laughs> All right, James, it's your turn. You bet. So, Snake was right. Thanks so much for your super chat. And he says, but we get it, Tom. We should go with the consensus, but we want the details of why the consensus believes what they do. Right, I would agree. I just don't want to get into the messy details of all the papers and books that have been published on this topic. I mean, it's out there to research. The consensus has reasons. It's not just arbitrary. I just don't want to go through all the details. It's kind of just a waste of time. Gotcha. So thank you so much for that question, and thank you so much for all of your super chats. Totally appreciate it, friends. We are excited about kind of mixing things up in terms of uh, improving our software, stuff like that. So whew, next up, new subscribers. I saw you guys pop up on the screen. Thanks so much, Travis Stewart, The Logical Christian Ministry as well, and Ashkash Bajash for subscribing. Glad to have you here as well as everybody else who's uh, joined us tonight. And uh, Ashkash Bajash, I was I was raised in Oshkosh in Wisconsin, so I don't know if you're from Oshkosh, but if you are, that's pretty awesome. So next, I am going to send the questions over to Shannon. I should say we're, we're splitting the questions. So these are the first huge clump of questions, which are, like I said, these are honestly really interesting questions. Shannon, hopefully you let me know if you get these. The first one is from Z Yonder. And Z Yonder, glad to see it. He says, reality is not as it seems, quantum mechanics to metaphysics to string theory. String suggests 10 plus dimensions. We only experience four. How isn't God and supernatural belief consistent? Is that for me or for Tom? I think it's for both of you. Sure, yeah, we'll do both. Why not? We asked how how is belief in God and the supernatural not consistent? No, I think how isn't God and supernatural belief consistent? I think what he's getting at is that we make inferences in, in, in theoretical physics to like super strings or loop quantum gravity or brain cosmology or multiverses, just things to explain why things are the way in the natural universe. And that's not, not that's that can be very metaphysical in that sense, in that 
they make these theories based on the data that we do have and they make inferences from there. I mean, we don't have any evidence of strings. I mean, there are some problems with string theory as it is. Uh, so these are, these are at this point are, are at least the very metaphysical. And this is why a lot of philosophers of science talk about the, metaphysic, the metaphysics involved in science in a lot of ways. When we develop these theories that we don't necessarily have data for right away, we're just trying to build a consistent model of reality. I mean, that's just, just basic theoretical physics. And when we do the same thing with metaphysical theories, but be it materialism, theism, panpsychism, it's a very similar in how it works. And in a lot of ways, it can be identical. So I think that's what he's trying to get at. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, I would say that uh, all physical theories are combinations of principles, particles, and laws in the field of physics. They just add them together in different ways to create different models of reality. And there is no principle, particle, or law of a conscious thing or a god of any kind. So that isn't, wouldn't qualify as a physical theory uh, by my definition. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Also, new subscribers, thanks so much. Michael Brown and Salem Coop, glad to have you join the community. And if you weren't here at the start, just want to let you know we're shooting for a nonpartisan platform. So no matter what worldview you're from, we're glad to have you. So uh, welcome. And uh, next up, Miguel Benitez Jr. says, question for Tom, isn't, uh, isn't there... He says, there are no square circles anywhere in the universe. And then he says, isn't that a metaphysical metaphysical claim that must be true? No, I would actually reject that. I agree with Descartes' uh, evil deceiver argument that we can never be certain about logical or uh, mathematical truths, and they could all just be delusions in our brain. So I would not grant that. I, I would say that it's most probable given the day that we do have, and we can make the metaphysical claim that it's most likely there aren't any. So that would be my, how I would handle that. Gotcha. Well, thank you both for your answers and thank you uh, for that question again. We appreciate it. Kicking it back over to Shannon. All right, so from Theistic Logos. For Michael, if I'm understanding this right, if the universe is a simulation of God's mind, how does Jesus enter into it? Well, the same way that you, know, you could create an avatar in a video game. It's just, I mean, Einstein said talk, teach through analogy, so that's why I would explain it. It got um, in. I have a video called Christianity and Panentheism, where I explain that there is this idea in theology that there is um, this essence energy distinction of God and God. Simply, the essence of God, Christ, uh, can enter into the energies in that sense. So, so think of it analogous to just an, av an avatar in a video game. Uh, this, the spirit of Christ can enter into a physical body. So Jesus is like the Sims. Yeah. <laughs> We're the Sims. We're the Sims. Jesus was Sim. one of the Sims. Okay, he became, gotcha. He became Sim who knew no Sim. All right, he's he was the Sim that we can that God controlled, and yeah. the rest of it. All right, gotcha. Fair enough. Okay, your turn, James. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And defend er ask Michael why God would create, or can you ask Michael why God would create this world to be so complicated with all these laws, biological processes, etc.? Why couldn't he make it simple? Um, well, it depends on what you mean. Why wouldn't he make it simple? Um, what do you mean by simple? Um, since I, I can't really ask him. Um, I mean, I, I look at the way, the, I like the way William Lane Craig answers this is pretty well. God is not an engineer. He's the artist. He enjoys creating for just for creating. He can create anything as complicated as he wants because, you know, he enjoys it. And I think when you look at the, the, the amazing laws we've discovered in physics and biology and chemistry, they're, they almost have a, a sense of beauty to them the way they work. And so, you know, you can't obviously scientifically show that, but it's just, that's how they strike us. And when I hear Miki Okaku or Brian Reed talking about how beautiful nature is, how beautiful science is, I think that's what, he, what we're getting at with it. I remember Miki Okaku talking about, you know, the, it's almost like, I'm probably butchering his quote here, but he almost like nature like sings this beautiful song of mathematics. And I, I think that's what it would be like. Okay, perfect. All right, so the next question I got lost for a second because there are so freaking many questions. Um, all right. So the next one is from Nick J. Uh, question for IP. Why is God the overarching mind behind all things? Why not some other thing? Would that seem similar to the question I asked? Like, aren't you just kind of regressing whatever caused the universe to be labeled God and then 
working from there to attribute a mind to it based on the evidence that you yeah. see. Yeah, if you get it, it's a good, uh, when you, if you see, I have two videos on the moral argument where I kind of explain why moral um, values and duties uh, imply a, a rational being, uh, that you actually just get to that. And so then that is what we just call God. So if you see my, my video on the moral argument and the follow up to it, uh, you kind of get that kind of idea of what I'm trying to get at. We don't start with the idea, of, okay, this is God. Now let's look for evidence of it. We see what is what are what evidence do we find, and what theories, what metaphysical uh, things do we think we can infer from this? And so that's kind of what we do. So if if the evidence would it would lead to the conclusion that it wasn't a god but something natural, then I I probably wouldn't say that is God. And by natural, I mean you know something that it's not conscious in that sense. But yeah, it's just it's just a title. It's a title for that's how natural theology works. We don't we you, you can't really get to the Christian God. You just get to a conscious mind and that's what we call god okay fair enough all right so the next question is for tom since there is an alternative explanation to atheism why accept the interpretations that made you an atheist shouldn't this debate be about the best explanation for or against um uh there's a principle in philosophy known as the principle of explosion from falsehood anything follows the point of me sh presenting an alternative to the theists and showing that all the arguments work equally as well for a non-god alternative is just to show they don't indicate a god i don't believe they indicate pantheism or theism i think they fail for both they're just false arguments for the most part so there's no reason to believe in theism and there's no reason to believe in pantheism so i'm just an atheist i don't know what the fundamental nature of reality is and i don't believe any form of human knowledge can justify any claims about what it is so i would be an atheist Okay, fair enough. I'm sorry, that was from Moj, Moj M Y Y M. Uh, all right, so this is for Tom as well, and this one is from Guzman1611. Did the universe have a beginning? Because in order for it to have a beginning, that by definition is supernatural, in order for all natural laws to be created. No, that would not be by definition supernatural. The, our universe could definitely have had a beginning from a cyclic universe where there was infinitely many expansions and collapses and expansions and collapses, or it could have had a beginning from a multiverse where it's just one of the infinitely many universes. Those would both be natural causes of the beginning of the universe. There could also be other things like a pantheism or a god that created it, or deism or all kinds of things. It doesn't need to be supernatural for the universe to have a beginning. Did you just say it doesn't, did you see, say that there could be other things like a God and then say that it doesn't need to be supernatural? Perhaps I didn't understand that portion of it. You might clarify right. that one. Right. It could be a supernatural thing like a God, but it could oh. be a non-supernatural thing like pantheism or the multiversal cyclic universe. Gotcha. Okay. So you were just including that in the full gamut of potential options. Right. Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I that you had the opportunity to clarify that. All right. So the next one is from Skyout. Uh, asked Tom, Tom, these ones are, these are leaning heavy on you now, guy. Where did physics come from or originate? Does the law of physics, the law of physics, does the law of physics create something? If not, how did physics create itself without a creator? Well, I would ask the same question of a theist and say, well, where, why does God have the properties that he has? And they would usually reply something like, well, it's just a part of his nature. And I could just say, well, all of the properties of physics are just a part of the nature of pantheism. Again, I just think it's a false argument to say those things and we don't really know. But anybody can make up answers and just attribute it to the proper the nature of some metaphysical theory like theism or pantheism. No, I, I would I would mostly okay. agree. Physics is a description of physical things in, in the natural universe, just like the laws of logic are a description of everything. I mean, these are just descriptions. Uh, Alexander Press has written a little bit on that, and I, I take his view with regards to physics. It's not like they don't bring things into existence or anything, but they're just descriptions of the physical universe in that sense and how things interact and operate in, phys in the physical reality. Awesome. Right, they're descriptive, not prescriptive. Yay, agreement. All right, perfect. So J.R. Ammon, A-M-M-O-N. -A this is a question for, T for Tom again. You argue that IP is using bad science. If IP got the science right, would his arguments be evidence for God? That's a pretty good question. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Yeah. I would highly encourage everyone to check out a book called For and Against Method. It's uh, several lectures by Emery Lakatos and his correspondent Paul Firebender on what science is, how it works, how it operates. It's a great book. I read it a couple years ago. Really uh, it helps elaborate on what science really is. Interesting. Okay. So this one is from Harry. 
And can IP and T jump sum up their arguments in a way a kid could understand? Because it is very hard for me to understand and keep up with you guys. I mean, sure. My my argument is that there's a lot of observable data that we have found that shows space time is emergent, that consciousness is irreducible, and as fundamental as is. And these are best explained, best excuse me, best explained in a uh, in a conscious mind that we would call God. Um, that's just basic. If I could simplify it as short as possible, get down to it. Okay. Uh, my argument would be that anything that we can discover could be explained equally by pantheism as by theism. And so there is no evidence of a conscious being. It's just one of the, another one of the things that can be explained by consciousness or just another natural thing that isn't consciousness. And there are, everything that we discover can be explained in that many ways. So there's nothing that we can discover to indicate a, any metaphysical properties like all powerful or all knowing or all good or any of those kinds of things. Perfect. You guys are doing fantastic. You're blasting through these questions. So this one is from Z Yonder. And just to let you know, there are there's still a significant amount more. <laughs> Do you think near death experiences offer valuable insight into the mind? No. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, there's a lot of interesting evidence for them. I did a I did a video on it a while back called part four of my case for the soul series. Um, so there's some interesting things in there. Um, there are, of course, obviously replies, but um, you know, that'd be an interesting discussion to have sometime. Yeah. Yeah, I watched that series. That's interesting, actually. All right. So, one second. I'm just going to find where I lost. So, from Luke Costello. Oh my gosh. James, stop messaging me. You're pushing them up. I was, I, don't worry. I, I can jump back in. I was going to, I was digging up uh, both questions and also some new people that just joined. So I want to say thanks so much for your uh, new joining the channel. We're glad to have you. JR, uh, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce these, uh, Joseph Cowery, Josiah Watson, and Mountain of Storms. Thrilled to have you guys here. Just, uh, it, we're excited uh, just to, to be here partying tonight. Yep. Did I ever tell you guys the story about when I went to sell? Never mind. So, <laughs> <laughs> like two seconds. I went to sell plasma after a debate, and they were like, "Why is your pulse so high?" And I was like, "I was just hosting an awesome debate." So anyway, I had to sit in the lobby. The point is this. <laughs> uh, next question, Luke Costello. Thanks for your question, buddy. He asks. He says, "I don't think these guys share the same idea of what metaphysical means." Uh, ask them to define it. Thanks for your question, Luke. I mean, right. It, so I define. Go ahead. You want to go ahead? No, All right. So I define metaphysics as a stopping point for truth. So the fundamental nature of reality, where there's nothing more beyond it. Yeah, it, I would. I would uh, pretty much agree with that basic idea. Um, I would, of course, disagree with the distinctions and what's what we're, what's available and what we can reason about it. But it's basic. When your metaphysics is what you believe reality is. If you think ghosts exist, that goes into your metaphysics. It's part of your, your ontology. If you think God exists, that'd be part of your metaphysics. If you think only naturalism is, a, you think naturalism is true, only the natural world exists, that would be part of your metaphysics. That would, you'd be a philosophical naturalist. So, I mean, it, it's basically what you think reality is, how it operates, what's a part of it, what principles we can use and apply and what those things mean. So it basically just encompasses a lot of those ideas. Okay, fair. So the next one is from Nick J uh, for T-Jump. Why should your opening analogy be accepted as true? Uh, what? Which opening analogy? I think the box on the rabbit. Yeah. Barely, yeah. It's logically consistent. Fair enough. And this one is from Nick J as well for T-Jump. Would you say that Plantinga, Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism actually serve to undermine theism theism uh it should undermine naturalism is the goal yeah, could have been typo uh, uh so plantiga's evolutionary argument against naturalism says that if evolution is true we have no reason to believe that our cognitive faculties uh, are are re represent reality because evolution doesn't select for reality it selects for survivability and I agree with that. It is true, which is why we have delusions and illusions and misconceptions of, of all kinds of things. Yes, we do. So we, our, our minds don't actually represent reality as it is. It, it's a caricature of reality. We, if we pick up a metal object and a plastic object, the metal object will feel colder than the plastic object, but they're both exactly the same temperature, room temperature. If we hold an object, it feels solid, but 99% of it is empty space between the electron and the, the nucleus of the atom. So we have lots and lots of things that our minds do not 
correctly respond to reality or does not correctly represent reality. I would I would say that's that's kind of arguing the way the introspective argument does. All we have access is to a mental reality. That's the whole point of the introspective argument. I think I would agree with that. Just, I'm going to interject for two seconds because the, uh, perception is my favorite thing. Further to that, like everything that we see, like I, I love visual perception. Everything that we see is not really what we see, like the conceptualization of what we're actually perceiving, like our, our proximal and distal stimuli in the world are, aren't actually a representation of, what, of what's taking place around us. Just via the shape of our eye and the construction of our eye, like everything that hits the phobia, by the time it gets there, it's upside down backwards and full of holes. What we, we, what we see right side up and completely consistent is not what's what's actually out there it's just a, an internal conceptualization that our brain does the best to put together so that we can actually operate our eyes are garbage so yeah i agree with that shannon you'd like a paper that came out i just read recently called space time and the brain and they kind of argue that the brain i mean they're i think they're a limited materialist but they kind of argue the brain constructs space it can trucks passage and rate of time. It was a very interesting paper. I think you'd enjoy that. I would very much love that because I studied perceptual cognition. That stuff's my jam. That's what I, that's what I love. Studying studying the visual cortex. I'll drop but, it in the chat there for you. Oh my God. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Studying the visual cortex was like a revelation to me when I realized that what I am seeing is that it's, I'm not seeing that. I made that. I created that. <laughs> that's not what happened. Anyway, sorry, that One, isn't about me. Somebody said something about perception. I'm gonna trigger. It was interesting. You triggered Shannon, and I wanna say um, thanks so much, a lukewarm lettuce, for joining. Uh, glad to have you here, buddy. And next, also question from Logos Theos. Question for Tom: Why are you using absolute metaphysical claims to deny absolute <laughs> metaphysical claims? I'm not. That is an objectively false statement because my statement only applies to human knowledge, which is a very limited subset of metaphysics. It's not a metaphysical claim responding to all knowledge. That's the difference, is that my claim can be supported because it's only in reference to human knowledge. It's not a claim about all possible knowledge or all possible stuff in reality. So there's a very big difference between claiming there is a God who was not created and no human amount of form of knowledge can justify the claim that God exists and was not created. Yeah, I basically responded to that throughout the debate. <laughs> hey, let's do that over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next is Tom Tom 34B to Michael Jones. How do you ascertain metaphysical claims? How do I ascertain? Probably um, the truth of, I guess, or or discern. Yeah, I, I, I would say we argue to the best explanation based on the data that we have. I mean, and that, people that make metaphysical claims like the, the, you know, there's no reason to believe in God. It's not part of our reality. Um, you know, that only naturalism is true. I mean, th those are metaphysical claims. I mean, we all do philosophy. If you start uh, talking about why we need philosophy or why it's important you're doing philosophy. So, I mean, we were always dealing within the philosophical realm. Science is built because of philosophy of science. Uh, you just use it for the same way you would do, obtain knowledge in other ways. The same way a theoretical physics, a physicist can make an inference to brain cosmology based on the data they have. I can also make inferences to a conscious mind outside of space time. Uh, it's not it's not complicated. I mean, any but I mean, I remember Michael Shermer talking about that basically all theories of consciousness right now are non falsifiable, because I mean, it's it's it, we're dealing in metaphysics when we do that. It's I love reading the debates between neuroscientists and philosophers and physicists going over consciousness and what theories explain it and what's best, and because it's, it's all metaphysics. I mean, that's you can't empirically verify a lot of this stuff we can only find correlations in the brain and whatnot so there's i mean that's just it's you, you can't get away from philosophy and therefore you can't get away from metaphysics it's just part of what we do and how we how we operate what do you mean when you say you can't we only find correlations in the brain well we like, would see um we don't see like the brain creating consciousness with, with this way we see kidneys creating urine uh, we mm -hmm. would say you know we, we see these correlations happening in the brain um, and so, you mean like activation regions? Like if I was look at, looking at an MRI and I, and I gave you a, a particular stimuli or a particular thing to think about and I could look at your activation region and then consistently see that amongst large groups of people. Yeah, yeah. You, would, see, you would see that more as correlation 
to the stimuli yeah, I, response? As, an, as, an, as a dual aspect idealist, I say these are partial images of the me mental processes they represent. So the patterns of the brain, the activity we can measure, these are just partial images of mental processes. Now, some would say that that's, that is actually the creation of consciousness somehow. But I mean, if you read someone like Thomas Nagel in his book, Mind and Cosmos, when you look at these correlations, you don't actually see sensations or tastes or smells. Even Sam Harris admitted that when he was debating Deepak Chopra. Um, you know, we don't, you know, the, when you look at the brain, you don't really see these, these mental experiences, these mental substances. Um, somehow we get, if you're a materialist or a physicalist, somehow we get from the brain to this inner world of perceptions and consciousness. And, and that, that's, that's the leap there. That's what, that's the hard problem of consciousness that we're trying to yeah. solve. And so, uh, idealists like myself would say the brain, the human body is, is it's a second person ex or it's a third person experience of a first person conscious experience. Of course, we're going to see correlations, uh, because if it is a conscious person, they're going to have to rep be represented somehow in the physical world. And so that's what we would argue. Um, I mean, it's a good so we're like a, we're a vessel and the brain is kind of like the interface. Kind so of. Yeah. I mean, uh, Donald Hoffman says it's a dumbed down user interface symbol. So it's like, when you look at like on your screen, you see the icons. I mean, you click on the icon, it does stuff. You can change, you can do stuff, but it's just, a, it's like a user interface symbol. This is a pretty good book written by a neuroscientist that I read recently. Um, Interesting. So would you say, would, I, I have so many questions about, so would you say that the same correlations that you say you see that, that we affiliate with conscious experience? So not just perception, but you know, where, where you can see certain activation regions, like you can see an amygdala response affecting anger, for example, right? right. So right. Would, you, would you set attribute the same sort of correlative uh, affiliations to like, like, like your prefrontal, mo like your motor cortex, just like in your prefrontal area? Like, would you consider that to be correlative as well when you can see activations consistently that are affiliated with external actions? Or is that only attributed to affiliations that are, um, are to, to activations and affiliations that are attributed to conscious experience because there's no tangible physical properties. No, I would say there's 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 going to be effects happening both ways, going back and forth. Because the brain would be a representation of the conscious agent in physical reality. I mean, teaching by analogy, be sort of like the avatar. And so, if you're going to uh, you know affect that in certain ways, like with brain damage, of course you're going to create changes to the conscious agent, especially how they're going to operate in reality. I think that's what you're getting at. I'm sorry if I misunderstood. No, no, not necessarily. I was more so going towards saying you could, we, we, um, we can see correlations mm -hmm. and you're saying that those correlations between are, aren't, aren't proof that conscious is an emergent property, but we see those same correlations, for example, in the motor cortex, mm -hmm. or, uh, if we see the same correlations, like if you look at Warnicke's and Broca's areas and you look at certain types of aphasias, like for either processing sound or producing speech, we can see those consistently taking place and there's physical, tangible, measurable properties in our actions and our movement in the physical world. So we, would, we wouldn't say that that movement is an emergent property of the function of our brain. We would say that that is the purpose of that part of our brain to generate and, and operate that part of our body or that part of our perception. Where do you delineate and say, that this part of our brain that we can see consistently being an activation region conscious experience that is separated out but the rest of this has a has a definite physical function um i guess i'm kind of getting lost in translation there so like the, uh, i think the you brain if i rephrase it sure go ahead yeah, sure. so there's a part of our brain that we can damage and we lose function in the bottom half of our body Mm -hmm. right. That is purely a function of the brain. That's not our souls of anything, probably. Probably not related to our soul in any way. So which, if we can damage a part of our brain to affect us, which part that, it, where does it stop being just a part of our body and start being a part of our soul? Similar, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, I'm also a monist. So I'm not, I'm not a substance dualism. And I say there's some sort of soul separate from the body. I would say the, the body, the brain is sort of like the physical representation of the, the conscious agent in reality. So if you affect how that conscious agent, but you know, brain brain damage or whatnot operates in reality, it's it's obviously going to affect, you know, how the conscious agent will, you know, be a, work and operate within reality. So yeah, this is the the brain would be the physical representation of what the conscious agent is doing within reality. Just like you know, if um, uh, what's the you know, 
like a Phineas Gage sort of like situation though. Like we're like if you look at Phineas Gage, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with with him. Like he had a he had a dampening yeah. rod go right up through his prefrontal cortex, yeah. and he was fine. <laughs> kind of, except for he turned into an asshole of yeah. what was previously like a really nice dude. Yeah, I mentioned him in my first video on the case for the soul. There's actually a lot of mythology that were, that sort of developed around him. We're not really sure if that actually did happen with him. Uh, but it does happen in other experiments where the, they have shown where you brain damage can cause changes in political views or whatnot. Right. Um, and yeah, and I, and I would expect that if idealism is true because you're, you're affecting the conscious agent, it, you know, the physical representation of the conscious agent. You know, so you're damaging the interface and if you exactly. damage the interface the output but then so that would mean that we're not a representation of our soul then we're just an interface we are in um we are a if, dumbed down user interface symbol i guess you could say so it, would our soul remain consistently the same is the and is completely dependent on the interface i'm so sorry so God damn it. We'll, we'll get to uh i'll let you answer mike sorry i mean i mean it, I'm trying to think how I should word this because I don't want to misconstrue it. But basically, uh, you would the soul would not be somehow disconnected from it. I mean, it was it would be how the soul operates and acts within physical reality. For if if referring to this, if we're defining soul as conscious agent, I need to be careful because soul gets thrown around as always defined in different contexts. Uh, it would the, if you damage the interface of how the conscious agent is operating and acting in reality, you're going to affect how they're going to do things. You're going to affect how they're going to think within physical reality, how they're going to operate with other incoming information from the physical world. Okay. So, I, I mean, maybe we could talk about that more. I, I feel like I, I need to like sit yeah. down, and talk to you more about it because I don't know if I'm. I hijack things. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know why anybody invites me anywhere. <laughs> I don't. Sorry, either. James. I lost so track of the question. We we <laughs> love you having you here. It's always fun. It's very fun to tease you. So. Uh, one last question, because JMD, so sorry, brother, I, I lost your question, and I appreciate you retyping it for me. So this is the last question, and uh, he asked for T jump. He said, "Does a, does T jump assume there are minds other than his own, which is a metaphysical absolute about reality? If not, how does he justify inductive reasoning like science?" So I start with, I think, therefore I am. That's the only absolute truth we can know. And then there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. And I can use some methodology to differentiate between these two things. And the methodology I use is science. So science can make testable predictions. If someone else has a mind, then I can expect them to act in a certain way. I can't prove they have another mind. I don't really care. But they can, they can meet the set of criteria of the predictions to justify belief they have a mind, even if I can't be absolutely certain they have a mind. You bet. Thank you very much. And last of all, I want to say thank you to our debaters. Thank you to Shannon. Uh, thank you for everybody being there, being here in the audience. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, let's see, strangely, we tried to fix the picture and I lost the picture. Don't worry, we're going to get through this. Um, <laughs> okay. This is... Uh, and it switched to my be right back sign, which says one second I'm naked. I'm not really naked. And uh, you are under your clothes. Tech, yeah, I guess that's true. So um, hold on, we'll see. Usually it comes back. I have no idea what just happened. So sorry about that. That's embarrassing. But I, I, I wanted to say more. I think JMD Apologetics is going to have me on sometime between tomorrow and this week and to talk about the conversation we had today. Sometime. So if anyone wants to check that out later, you can always tune in for that. Excellent. Let me know. We can put the link for any after shows in the description. So with that, we just want to say thank you for everybody being here. The debaters links are in the description. Highly encourage you to check them out because even if you don't agree, hey, you can actually get it, their argument straight from the horse's mouth. And Shannon's is down there as well. And we want to say thanks for her help. And debaters, we just can't thank you enough. We, we hope you have a great night. And uh, thanks for coming on. So with that... Uh, well, do you have any parting words, debaters? Uh, thanks for having me on. I always appreciate the opportunity. It was a fun debate. Thanks for inspiring philosophy for coming on and debating. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thanks I was for... really happy with the outcome. Thanks for coming on, Tom. I've been looking forward to this for all month. It's been a blast. Thank you very much, uh, both of you and Shan in the audience. So with that, I want to remind everybody, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable, and have a good night. Take care, everybody.